welcome to the Director's duties and responsibilities and disclosure obligations under Philippine Law on Climate Change Risks Panel Discussion and Legal Opinion Launch Organized by the Institute of Corporate Directors, Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative, and Client Earth UK I am Sora Magna and I will be your host for today Before we start with the program, let me quickly remind everyone of the house rules Kindly put your phones on silent mode to avoid any distractions. During the panel discussion, please take note of your questions. And then during the Q&A segment, you may approach the microphones located at the sides and the center of the hall to ask your questions and please wait to be acknowledged by the moderators. Please accomplish the evaluation form that will be provided at the end of the program. This will prompt us to create your e-certificate. Also, this event is being recorded for internal documentation purposes only. And lastly, in case of any emergency, do not hesitate to approach the ICD staff present in this event to assist you. So these are the house rules. Please observe them. Today, we will be discussing the role of company directors and their responsibilities in addressing climate change risks under Philippine law. On the first segment of the program, we will be welcomed by ICD President Ms. Maria Aurora J. Dina Garcia, and then we will hear a keynote address from SEC Commissioner McJill Bryant Fernandez through a recorded message. Afterwards, Attorney Alex Cooper will present the key points of the legal opinion and its international context. In the second segment, our moderators will facilitate the panel discussion where we have a distinguished panel of experts who will share their knowledge and insights on climate change risks. Next to that will be a closing remarks from attorney Ruel A. Refran, Chief Operating Officer of the Philippine Stock Exchange. And finally, we will open the floor for any questions from our audience, during which lunch will be also served. We will also witness the induction of new ICD members at the end of our program. So without further ado, let us begin today's event. I would like to welcome on stage Ms. Maria Aurora Giotina Garcia, President of the Institute of Corporate Directors, to give us a few words of welcome. Let us give her a warm round of applause. A pleasant morning, a good morning to everyone. It's good, nice to see a lot of friends and colleagues uh, who seem to show interest in this topic today. So let me begin by recognizing our esteemed speakers and resource persons. First is Attorney Roel Reflan from the Chief Operating Officer of the Philippine Stock Exchange, Dean Cesar Villanueva, Chairman of the ICD Board of Trustees, and the lead author of the legal opinion which will be presented in this event, Ms. Charissa Babinuesa, Independent Director of Manila Water Company, Mr. John Eric Francia, President and CEO of ASIN, Mr. Alex Cabrera, Vice President of the Management Association of the Philippines. Mr. Thomas Clark, General Counsel of the Asian Development Bank. Attorney Alex Cooper, Corporate Finance and Climate Change Lawyer of the Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative. Mr. Peter Barnett, Energy Systems Head of Client Earth. Attorney Joyce Melkartan, Senior Lawyer of Client Earth and Attorney Isa Marie Castillo Espiritu, Assistant Director for the Corporate Governance Division of the Securities and Exchange Commission. As you can imagine, since this is a discussion on the legal aspects of this uh, uh, recent, well, the, the launch, uh, the paper that will be launched today, I can imagine that there are many other lawyers in this room. So distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, and fellow advocates of climate action. It is my great pleasure to welcome you, to welcome you all to today's events. The legal opinion launch and panel discussion on the topic, director's duties and responsibilities, and disclosure obligations under Philippine law on climate change risks. As a president of ICD, Philippines, I'm honored to host this event, which highlights ICD's commitment to promoting good governance and sustainability practices in the corporate sector. 
The legal opinion that will be launched officially today was in fact published last November 2022 and was written against the backdrop of a climate crisis. Climate change is one of the most pressing challenges of our time. And it is affecting not only our environment, but also our economies and societies. This has prompted governments and businesses across the world to take decisive action to transition to a new economic model that is aligned with the Paris Agreement's objective of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 or earlier with clear interim milestones in 2040 and 2030, consistent with keeping the average temperature increase to no more than 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. And speaking of wet, warm weather, I'm sure all of you who have been in Manila for the last one or two weeks have experienced rather hot, not only warm weather, in the country. As corporate leaders, we have a vital role to play in addressing this issue and ensuring that our companies are resilient and responsive to climate risks. This necessitates systemic transformation in how companies are governed. For board directors, it means placing the net zero mindset at the heart of corporate strategy, engaging this cultural shift company-wide, and ensuring that board decision-making processes properly embed climate considerations. I wish to con congratulate the team of legal experts for their hard work in crafting the legal opinion that will be launched today, which emphasizes the case for corporate directors on the boards of Philippine companies to consider climate change-related risks in the discharge of their fiduciary duties of obedience and diligence to fulfill their company's long-term legal, economic, moral, and social obligations towards their shareholders and other stakeholders. I'm also delighted that we have a distinguished panel of experts and thought leaders in this event. Key stakeholders representing different sectors, corporates, directors, senior management, regulators, lawyers, of course, and international financial institutions who will share their knowledge and insights about the changing landscape of climate risk, governance, and what directors can expect as they navigate the space. So I'd like to extend the warmest thanks and heartfelt appreciation to our partners and organizers of this special event, the Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative and Client Earth, whose unwavering support and dedication have been instrumental in making this collaborative event possible. CCLI and Client Earth have been at the forefront of advocating for climate justice and supporting legal initiatives that advance climate action. We look forward to continuing our partnership with you in promoting sustainability, good governance, and the rule of law. Thank you for your commitment to this cause, and we are honored to have you as our partners in this endeavor. So I hope that today's event will be informative, engaging, and thought-provoking. May it inspire us to take action towards a more sustainable and resilient future where our companies thrive and our planet thrives. Thank you very much. So let me now follow my message with this introduction of our keynote speaker, which I'm privileged to do at today's event, Commissioner McKill Brian T. Fernandez. He was appointed as SEC Commissioner on March 8, 2022. Before joining this commission, the commission, he served as the Deputy Executive Secretary for General Administration, or DESGA, under the office, the office of the President. As DESGA, he assisted the Executive Secretary in articulating policy directives of the President 
through executive orders and other ordinances, processing of applications for the establishment of special economic zones, evaluation of special authorities for executive agreements, foreign loans and grants, and addressing policy, legal, and administrative concerns of various agencies in the executive department, as well as government-owned or control and controlled corporations, or GOCCs. He concurrently represented the Office of the President and Executive Secretary in several interagency committees and oversight bodies, including the Development Budget Coordination Committee, the Fiscal Incentives Review Board, the Cabinet Cluster on Economic Development, and various committees and technical committees of the National Economic Development Authority. Commissioner Fernandez likewise served on the governing boards of different GOCCs, including the Laguna Lake Development Authority, Development Academy of the Philippines, and the Philippine Center for Economic Development. We would have really wanted the commissioner to be in with us in person, but nonetheless, we'd like to uh, extend our appreciation for he, him delivering a Tate message as he has to uh, be present in quite important uh, meeting. So ladies and gentlemen, let us give a warm round of applause to Commissioner McGill Brian Fernandez. To the Institute of Corporate Directors, the Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative, Client Earth, our esteemed speakers, distinguished guests, and colleagues, a pleasant morning to all of you. And my profuse apologies for not participating in the event physically. It would not be the first time for you to hear what climate scientists have to say, but in events like today's, it bears repeating, if only to set the context for why incorporating climate and sustainability considerations in corporate governance is extremely important. It's an area boards need to navigate deftly in order to keep their companies ahead of the game in a world beset by climate and nature crises. After all, the first thing to solving any problem is recognizing there is one. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, Southeast Asia will experience a wide range of worsening conditions and disasters, including dangerous heat waves, intense rain events, powerful tropical cyclones, and coastal cities inundated by rising sea levels. In the Philippines, we are particularly exposed to these risks, with the Global Risk Report 2022 stating that we rank first in the world in risk exposure to natural disasters, including events which are predicted to become more frequent and more severe as climate change worsens. The Philippines' nationally determined contribution even expressly recognizes that the country is extremely vulnerable to climate-related and geological hazards. To drive the point, our children in the region will witness increased losses in coastal settlements and infrastructure due to flooding caused by unavoidable sea level rise. All this disrupt the social fabric that weaves communities together and interrupts schooling, livelihoods, healthcare services, and even access to food and water. Responding to scientists' wake-up call means decreasing global carbon emissions by 48% from 2019 levels by 2030 reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2050, and then achieving net negative carbon emissions. Even then, we will likely overshoot the 1.5 degree target, initially hitting 1.6 degrees Celsius between 2041 and 2060, and then dropping back below 1.5 degrees by 2100. This, however, is not just about protecting the environment. Climate change poses material financial risks to companies and their business models, potentially undermining not just the financial system, but also the real economy. While transition risks caused by a movement to a low emission economy can have significant and wide-ranging impacts, without climate action, 
According to the World Bank, Economic damages in the Philippines could possibly reach up to 7.6% of GDP by 2030 and 13.6% of GDP by 2040. The IPCC has said the climate crisis calls for deep, rapid, and sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from all sectors and stakeholders. This is why the UN has formed partnerships with the private sector to find solutions, and many in the private sector have responded, not only because it is the right thing to do, but also because, first, being early movers and spotting opportunities in the transition is very good for business. Second, in some cases, like in the fossil fuel industry, doing nothing is existential. And third, climate action is increasingly what clients and markets are demanding of businesses. External pressures driven by the increasing climate consciousness of investors provide further incentives for companies to drive and demonstrate real progress in line with a low carbon future, manage systemic climate risks affecting their value chains, and shift capital to value creating businesses, and provide meaningful disclosures that help stakeholders understand their strategies and targets. Mindful of our mandate to supervise the corporate sector, protect the investment public, and promote good corporate governance, we in the Securities and Exchange Commission expressly recognize that climate risks, as with other economic, environmental, social, and governance risks, must be transparently communicated to the market in order to ensure that capital is efficiently allocated, investors are protected, and corporations are governed responsibly. While we have taken significant steps towards this goal, including updating the Corporate Governance Code in 2016 to encourage corporations to put in place a board-level policy on the disclosure of EESG information, and issuing the Sustainability Reporting Guidelines for publicly listed companies in 2019, in relation to which we are pleased to see that many companies have risen to the challenge both in the number and quality of the reports. Admittedly, much can still be done. As such, our ongoing review of the sustainability reporting guidelines attempts to incorporate global developments, especially the standards and frameworks, with respect to climate and sustainability-related disclosures. We are also looking at crafting a report form that shall summarize the PLC's performance metrics in the economic, environmental, and social areas. The number of sustainability reporting metrics shall be grouped into qualitative and quantitative disclosures and classified as mandatory or voluntary indicators. The Commission has also committed to develop a roadmap for the potential introduction of sustainability reporting to other SEC-regulated entities starting with industries having the most impact on the environment. Rest assured, though, that you, our stakeholders, will be invited to voice your comments in this process. The concomitant challenge, of course, is for the boards of directors to proactively think about how they can identify and manage these risks. Whether you do this through specific committees, scenarios and analysis, or experts is management's call. What we see in any case is that the circumstances present an opportunity to stay ahead of the game and contribute to the movement to cleaner and more sustainable economy where companies and their boards may stand to profit. If only to share that we are walking our talk, the SEC has integrated sustainability targets and practices across all areas of operations. We have conducted a materiality assessment for the organization, determined baselines, and incorporated sustainability initiatives as part of our individual and office performance commitments. Alongside the digital trust and shift to online transactions, including payments, regulations are being reviewed to reduce those, if not eliminate, the need for paper copies of submissions. There is also a monthly Green End Bank, or Green Bank, where sustainability-related issuances and measures are deliberated including your sustainability link bonds, green, blue, or blue-green bonds. Just last week, the Commission held its first Sustainability Week. We'd like to think that we are one of those leading 
if not the one leading, in sustainability initiatives in the government. The Commission welcomes fora like this that attempt to move the conversation into new and interesting areas. For it is only through a thorough rethinking of our practices, systems, and policies that we could avoid or at the very least mitigate the worst effects of climate change. We hope that we will have a vibrant discussion today. We welcome spirited discussions and collaboration with stakeholders as this will surely benefit our pursuit of meaningful, responsive, and consensus regulations. Finally, I congratulate the council team for their work on the legal opinion, and thank you all for attending today. Good morning. We know you're all excited to learn about the legal opinion that will be launched today. So let's not delay any further, and let me introduce our next speaker. Alex Cooper is a corporate finance and climate change lawyer at the Commonwealth Climate Initiative, or CCLI. He has worked in collaboration with lawyers across Asia to advance the legal analysis of climate change and director's duty, duties across a number of jurisdictions, including India, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and the Philippines. He has co-authored the CCLI's legal analysis, Fiduciary Duties and Climate Change in the United States, and worked with the Climate Governance Initiative on the production of the Global Primer on Director's Duties and Climate Change. He is a UK qualified lawyer with significant experience in the dispute resolution department at a Magic Circle law firm, where he assisted clients in litigation before the High Court and Court of Appeal and in regulatory investigations. He also acts as a legal consultant on biodiversity issues with a number of so civil society entities. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause, please, for attorney Alex Cooper. Thank you, Ms. Magno, and thank you to the Institute of Corporate Directors uh, and Client Earth for their cooperation and support on this event. Uh, it's an honor for us to be working with you, and we're very grateful. Esteemed guests, panelists, good morning. Thank you very much for coming today. It's great to see so many of you here with an interest in corporate go governance, and we're delighted to welcome uh, directors, lawyers, uh, regulators, and so many more from different stakeholders across, uh, across the Philippines. It's a privilege to speak to you today. My name is Alex Cooper, uh, and I'm a lawyer with the Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative, or CCLI. We're a UK-based NGO founded by the Oxford University School of Enterprise and the Environment, the Environmental Charity Client Earth, and the Prince of Wales' Accounting for Sustainability organization. We conduct legal research and commission independent analysis from counsel in different jurisdictions on obligations under existing securities, companies, and financial laws for directors and uh, uh, asset owners in respect of climate change. We've commissioned a number of legal opinions on this topic from eminent counsel around the world, covering jurisdictions including Australia, Canada, uh, the United Kingdom, the United States, India, Hong Kong, Japan, Singapore, and Malaysia. And of course, we're very excited today to include the Philippines as well. And we're so pleased to be discussing the legal opinion with you and climate governance more generally uh, with esteemed colleagues such as yourselves. I'd like to thank Dean Cesar Villanueva, Dean Lily Gruber, Attorney Angelo uh, Patrick Advincula, and Attorney Joyce Wong uh, for their outstanding work on this opinion. It's a really robust and thorough legal analysis and sets out clearly that the duties of Philippine corporate directors include the consideration and governance of climate change risks arising in the current situation. So I'd like to briefly summarize the findings of the legal opinion and give you an overview of the international context in which it is situ situated. Essentially, I'd like to answer two questions. One, how does climate change pose risks to companies? And then secondly, what do directors need to do about this in order to meet their legal duties? I'll start by speaking about what these risks are and then discuss the international context and finally focus on the Philippines to summarize what the findings of the legal opinion are. Climate risks are, common, are commonly categorized as physical risks and transition risks and often as a part of transition risks, the legal risks that arise from these developments. Physical risks are probably uh, among the first things you think about when considering climate change. 
As the IPCC has told us, climate change increases the severity and likelihood of extreme weather events, as well as having gradual onset effects such as rising sea levels, ocean acidification, and changing climactic temperatures. The IPCC tells us that climate change is likely to make extreme weather events more likely and more severe, uh, as well as, uh, and the Philippines is particularly exposed to these risks. The Global Climate Risk Index in 2021 found that it was the fourth most impacted country for the preceding two decades between 2000 and 2019. We know what we need to do to address these risks. Uh, the IPC tells us that we need to reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2050 uh, and take steps towards halving them by 2030. Uh, as, these, as the policy changes and regulatory changes needed to achieve these goals come into effect, we should expect to see transition risks. These are the risks which businesses face as a result of the change to net zero. They can come from policy and regulatory developments and also from consumer preference and technological changes, as well as changes in public opinion. The Philippines' nationally defined contribution submitted to the UNFCCC states that it will reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 75% by 2030, which will have colossal impacts across the whole of the economy. And so we should expect to see government policy in line with that goal, and indeed already have. Uh, as we've heard from Commissioner Fernandez, the SEC is an active uh, propagant of this. Uh, the uh, Central Bank of the Philippines has taken steps towards this, and we have seen the Department of Energy's coal moratorium in 2020 already have an effect on the market. Finally, legal risks uh, include litigation and regulatory risks associated with the, th with the previous two categories of risk. So the three categories are very much in interconnected. There have been more than 2,000 climate-related cases now brought around the world, uh, with more than a quarter of these being filed since 2020. Historically, these have been brought against governments and government bodies, but now we're starting to see a movement in which corporations and their boards are being held accountable. We're seeing increasing recognition of climate risk as a material financial risk by governments and regulators in the world. For example, financial regulators in Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, India and Japan, as well as in Europe, the UK and the US, and of course the Philippines, uh, have recognised climate change as being a financial risk with impacts upon companies and the economy as a whole. Governments in at least 22 countries have set in target uh, greenhouse, gas reductions, uh, greenhouse gas reductions and many more have introduced this as part of their uh, nationally determined contributions. Uh, over 20 governments and regulators now require or encourage sustainably related disclosures of publicly listed companies. Uh, to focus on the Asian region, we are seeing regional developments across the region in step. In Malaysia, listed companies have been required to publish sustainability statements uh, covering material, economic, environmental, social and governance risks since 2016. Guidance uh, referring to the TCFD rec recommendations was published in 2018. And in September last year, uh, Bursa Malaysia issued an amendment to the sustainability restatement requirements including in introducing climate change related disclosures in line with the TCFD recommendations as mandatory. Similarly, in Singapore, the Singapore Exchange Group has required listed companies to furnish uh, sustainability reports since 2016, with guidance issued on this prior in, 2020, in 2011. In 2021, the, S uh, the SGX issued amendments to the listing rules require, uh, regarding sustainability issues, including a requirement for TCFD aligned disclosures and for first time directors to undertake sustainability training. And as we've heard from Commissioner Fernandez, we're seeing a similar development in the Philippines with the uh, changes to the corporate governance code in 2016 requiring consideration of stakeholder values to the uh, 2019 circular requiring a sustainability statement and now the introduction of mandatory uh, sustainability statements later in the year. Internationally, there is also uh, convergence on climate disclosures around the uh, IFRS's International Sustainability Standards Board, which is working on a global baseline of sustainability-related disclosures. Uh, these disclosure requirements generally are aligned, towards, uh, are aligned to the Task Force uh, on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures recommendations published in 2017. Notably, this includes the requirement to disclose how, company, how the company identifies and manages climate-related risks, as well as the management structures in place to oversee this. And this is also reflected in the uh, Philippine stock, in the sorry, in the SEC um, circular on climate on sustainability statement, uh, and in the ISSB disclosure requirements. 
So the management of these risks is central to how uh, investors, regulators, uh, and, um, uh, and, inve uh, and companies need to be considering these risks. While there are some differences between jurisdictions, um, for example, some jurisdictions require reporting only on risks, whereas others require disclosure of greenhouse gas emissions at a quantitative level, uh, and others um, focus on different international standards, such as the GRI or SASB standards, we're seeing an increasing uh, tr uh, convergence around TCFD standards and the management uh, of climate-related risk disclosures which these require. So what do these factors mean for directors' duties? Well, from an international perspective, we've looked at jurisdictions around the world. And while we're, there are differences between jurisdictions, the fundamental legal principles remain the same. Directors are required to act in the best interests of their companies for the benefit of their, uh, of their shareholders and to act with due care, skill and diligence. In the Philippines, this is referred to as the, uh, as the standard of a prudent director. Therefore, uh, overseeing and, and managing climate change risks is simply an extension of this. Uh, the logic of these presets is applied to climate change risk in the same way as it would be applied to any other material financial risk facing the company. Facing the company. Uh, as climate change risks are global, we are seeing this taken up around the world. Uh, an important point to note on this, and from what I put on the slides, uh, uh, which I'll cover, uh, is that director's duties, in particular the duty to act with care, skill and diligence, is judged to both an objective and a subjective standard. Um, when considering the objective standard, the courts consider what a prudent director would do. So the question of what a prudent director is, is obviously important. In the UK, we've had judges who have spoken extrajudicially about how, this, how the standard of a prudent director might change as the regulatory and civil society expectations of them change. So in the context of, um, in the context of climate change related disclosures and the management of climate change related risks becoming, regulator, uh, becoming mandated and becoming expected, what a prudent director would be required to do in order to meet their legal duties will increase to meet that. Uh, to just take Lord Sales's point from the top quotation there, uh, an assessment of the practical implications of the director's duties has to take account of the general environment of expectation created by initiatives by regulators and in civil society. Since an increasing number of jurisdictions have passed regulations or rules requiring on at least a comply or explain basis that climate risk should be disclosed, including the management of these risks, it would be difficult, we think, for a director to argue that they had met their legal duties if they failed to consider these risks. So what does this look like under Philippine law? The legal opinion is very thorough and detailed and outstanding piece of work. So I'm afraid I will only be able to touch on a few key points here but I highly recommend that you read it. Uh, and there's also a summary of key findings available. Uh, you can find both of these by scanning the QR code on the back of your leaflets, which are on your tables. Firstly, uh, the critical role of directors in managing climate change risks is emphasized. Uh, as with every other jurisdiction in which we have looked at, climate change risks must be managed like any other risks the company faces. As the legal opinion finds, under Philippine corporation law, the risks facing and losses sustained by the corporation relating to climate change fall within the same category as other foreseeable financial risks faced by directors of for-profit corporations and are within the scope of their duties to act in the best interests of the corporation and its shareholders. These duties go with the, corporate, with the code of corporate governance making it clear that directors owe duties to wider stakeholders as well as their companies holders. The disclosure of these duties is also, is also important. The Philippine Stock Exchange disclosure rules require the disclosure of material information. This is a broad definition uh, and would generally include the disclosure of climate related ri risks as these can be, as we've already discussed, financially material, particularly when such risks can impact the trading and price of company shares. And the SEC sustainability statement rules go further with comply or explain, explain provisions regarding sustainability related information, which as we have heard, may be being made mandatory soon. But perhaps as, de as demonstrating to directors who might be skeptical about these risks, that they may need to take them into account in order to meet their duties, 
The legal opinion also gives surety to directors who may want to take more climate positive decisions in their governance of the companies. The legal structure around and the principles around the directors' duties are permissive and allow directors to take into account a wide range of factors when fulfilling their duties. And the legal opinion explains this uh, by explaining how the board's business judgment rule, where the court will defer to a director's experience in business matters, can protect directors to an extent. Where directors want to act in a business judge, in a, sorry, in a climate positive way, this rule will protect them, provided that they act reasonably. I also want to mention the opportunities available to companies as well. The urgent need to transition to a net zero global economy and the rapid market adjustments that this requires will create many opportunities for disruptive technologies. We've seen front runner Philippine uh, companies take steps towards this, setting out ambitious net zero targets and transition plans to get there. Capital is increasingly available for companies seeking to move away from polluting industries and activities with green bond issuances by the Philippine government and private corporations increasing to $2.8 billion during the first half of 2022, already exceeding borrowings through uh, ESG instruments and debt instruments over the past two years. So I'll, uh, I'll conclude this, this section by saying that the law and director's duties are permissive rather than prescriptive. Climate risks and the opportunities available, as well as the regulations and guidance which encourage sustainability action, give directors a reason to act and they can do so with confidence that their actions are permitted and will be legally protected. Finally, regulatory guidance sets out frameworks for how directors can do this. The corporate governance codes encourage boards to de define a risk management strategy to identify and analyze economic, social and governance risk relating to the company's business strategy and develop risk mitigation plans for the most important risks, as well as put in place systems for communicating key risks to the board. Establishing a dedicated sustainability at a board level can be a good way of ensuring that sustainability related risks are factored in as part of this risk management framework. Uh, and as the legal opinion explains, compliance with uh, best practice in the enterprise risk management is the best, best way for companies and their boards to avoid litigation risk, reputational risk and potential liability, as well as ensure that they are meeting their legal duties. We and our partners have commissioned a number of legal opinions from independent counsel on this topic in jurisdictions around the world. I just want to make the final point that the Philipp this understanding of director's duties is far from unique to the Philippines and is part of a global trend. In line with evolving social and regulatory expectations and a climate context, there are risks for companies and boards which are being increasingly recognized, but there are also opportunities. We know what the impacts are and what they will be, we know what the risks are and how they will develop, and we know what the opportunities are and which will become available. Boards need to take action to seize this and ensure that their companies thrive in the coming years. I'd like to conclude by thanking the authors of the legal opinion again for their tremendous work on this, and the ICD and the Client Earth for their collaboration on this event, and urging you, the audience members, to consider how, this, how climate risk may affect your business and your legal duties. I'm looking forward to the panel discussion and hearing the different perspectives there. And we're looking forward to your questions and we'd like to hear about how you are negotiating these risks. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Attorney Alex, for that very informative presentation. We are happy to inform the attendees that the legal opinion and its key messages are available online. We have not provided printed copies to minimize carbon emissions associated with printing numerous quantities of paper. Flashed on screen is a QR code that you may scan to access the legal opinion and a summary of key findings. We will now proceed to the panel discussion segment of our program. Let me first introduce our moderators for today who will also introduce the panelists. Attorney Joyce Melkar Tan, is a senior lawyer at Client Earth's Energy Systems Asia team based in London. Her work contributes to the Philippines' transition to a climate-neutral economy and to capacity enhancement in the field of climate and environmental law. She works with civil society, the academe, and other stakeholders to strengthen climate action to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. She is a Philippine and New York qualified lawyer with a background in climate and energy policy. She was previously an associate at CSIP Law 
where her practice included energy and natural resources regulation. She has also consulted with the Asian Development Bank, been involved in UN climate and biodiversity treaty negotiations, and worked with the Global South Human Rights NGO based in Bogota, Colombia. Joining her as co-moderator is none other than Dr. Carla Jose Charlie Gatmaitan, Chief Executive Officer of the Institute of Corporate Directors. Let us welcome on stage Attorney Joyce Melkartan and Dr. Charlie Gatmaitan. Good morning, Charlie. Good morning, Joyce. Good morning, everyone. So, Charlie, shall we ask them to come and join us on stage? Yes. Uh, we, shall we ask them to come now or shall we introduce them one by one? What do you Maybe we to? can ask them to come on stage right. as we introduce them. Okay. We, we begin, of course. Um, Joyce, maybe you can start with the, our first panelist yep. today. Sure. So, we would like to invite on stage Dean Cesar Villanueva who is a founding partner of Villanueva, Gabionza, and D Law Offices. He was previously the chairman and CEO of the Governance Commission for GOCCs, or the GCG, for which he received the Presidential Medal of Merit by His Excellency President Benigno Aquino III. He is also a former dean of the Ateneo de Manila Law School and is author of several leading legal books used in classrooms across the country. These include commercial law, corporate law, and corporate governance. Welcome, Cesar. Up next, we invite to the stage Ms. Sharisa Nuesa. She has over 15 years of board directorship experience. She has covered a wide range of industries, including property, water, power, education, fund management, manufacturing, and retail. She currently sits on the boards of publicly listed Manila Water Company, Integrated Microelectronics Incorporated, Far Eastern University, and its non-public subsidiary, Fern Reality Corporation. She has been active in board level governance, risk management, and sustainability committees. Welcome, Sharisa. Up next, we invite Mr. John Eric Francia. He is the president and CEO of ASEN. Under his leadership, Ayala established its energy platform from a, from a standing start in 2011 to become one of the largest renewable energy platforms, not just in the Philippines, but in Southeast Asia. This now has over 2,000 megawatts of attributable renewables capacity. Welcome, uh, Mr. Francia. And Charlie, I've been talking a lot, so why don't I hand over to you? Okay. Thomas Clark is the general counsel of the Asian Development Bank. He has over 30 years experience in legal and government affairs practice, spanning the financial services, energy, and infrastructure sectors. Mr. Clark was previously managing director and co-head of the Americas for the Global Public Policy Group of BlackRock Incorporated the world's largest asset management firm, where he drove regulatory policy. He also engaged with thought leadership on infrastructure, finance, ESG, and sustainability, disclosures related to climate risk and energy transition issues, data privacy, and fintech. Welcome, Thomas, who just flew in. Uh, when did you come in? Fly in, Thomas. Oh, you're based in Manila, but you just, you just got back recently from all over the world. This will be, uh, Mr. Clark is followed by attorney Alexander Cabrera, who is the vice president of the Management Association of the Philippines and is the chairman emeritus and ESG leader at Pricewaterhouse Coopers of PwC Philippines. Welcome, attorney Alex, certified public accountant, lawyer, specializes in tax planning, business restructuring and reorganizations. His key ex expertise is delivering integrated tax, legal and accounting advice. Also um, a board member in PwC's Southeast Asia Regional Consulting Practice. Before that, he was the tax managing partner. I'd also like to welcome our friend from the PSE. Attorney Roel Rifran is the Chief Operating Officer at the Philippine Stock Exchange. He is a CPA lawyer with over two decades of experience in law, finance, and capital market regulation. Subject matter expert and thought leader on capital markets, security, securities regulation, and finance. 
Attorney Refran provides expert testimony before con Congress on vital legislation affecting capital markets. Yeah, and finally, we have one seat here, and we would like to invite on stage Mr. Alex Cooper, whom we have just heard from. So he has been introduced already. So Alex, just please come on stage. Hello again. Great, thank you and welcome everyone. It's really great to have you all here. So since we are launching the legal opinion today, why don't we start with its lead author? So Cesar, you have opined that under Philippine corporation law, the risks arising from, from climate change are like other foreseeable financial risks within the scope of director's duties to act in the best interest of the corporation and its shareholders. Given the rapidly evolving climate and investor expectations on responsible corporate governance, how do you think should lawyers be incorporating climate risk in their advice to their clients? Um, thank you, Joyce. I think that uh, with Commissioner Bryan confirming that we are now number one under the 2022 Global Risk Index, it is incumbent upon lawyers in legal practice to really adv advise very well, very closely their clients, directors and management, especially publicly listed companies, that uh, climate change risks are real, both the physical and, tr and the uh, transition risk, which together uh, bring about the litigation and reputational risk that directors and companies uh, are facing. Therefore, they should tell them that they should inform their clients clearly that they do, po uh, they do face uh, a lot of risk related to climate change, including actions coming from the government sector seeking to make them criminally, civilly, or administratively liable for failing to comply with uh, clauses against prohibited acts. And now we do have, peculiarly in this country, a citizen's right to sue both the public sector and the private sector for failure to um, regard properly the citizen's right to health and to a healthful ecology. And then you do have the administrative penalties that can be imposed directly on um, directors and also of publicly listed companies for failure to discharge their obligation to disclose. Therefore, as attorney Alex, he, and he likes that because they're, it's the first time that he's addressed as attorney, right? <laughs> and attorney Alex is, is, uh, has explained very well, therefore, that in order to guard against such risk related to climate change, boards of directors must ensure that they, among other things, that they put up and monitor enterprise risk management structures that really address this. They communicate well with their stakeholders on how they're meeting climate change uh, risk and opportunities and to tell the public, both the regulators and the stakeholders, how they're proceeding with being able to achieve this or take advantage even of climate change related opportunities. That's what they have to do. They have to, they have to be more dynamic, so to speak, right? When it comes to this. Indeed, thanks. And underlying all of the good corporate governance action is a necessity for a robust regulatory framework. But as Dean Villanueva says, it's really important that boards are on top of the strategy and the vision for what they see their companies doing within a net zero world. So Ms. Charissa Nuesa, you, you've been a director of publicly listed companies for many, many years. Could you share real life examples of how boards have been considering climate risk? Have you seen this evolve at all from being considered primarily as either environmental or something related to corporate social responsibility to something that is considered as materially financial and foreseeable? Well, thank you for that question, Joyce. Um, good morning, everyone. 
I've been privileged to sit on the boards of governance-oriented, publicly listed companies. So I think I have some good news to share, although a lot uh, still needs to be done, obviously. First, what I'm seeing now as compared to the past is that the discussions and deliberations have been elevated actually to board levels and board committee levels. And unlike before that a lot of these are you know, embedded in governance committees, there are now separate sustainability committees, there are chief sustainability officers, so a lot of discussions are going on in the board. And we are able to relate this to our business strategies and risk governance. So that's the first. Second is that actually the standards, the metrics, um, the targets that have been set are now more science-based, more research-based, more specific. And uh, let me share some examples uh, very quickly. Well, Manila Water, which of course I, I represent today, um, is actually an awardee uh, very recently, first in Asia, first in Southeast Asia, first in the Philippines, of being a climate smart utility. Now, Manila Water has targeted that by 2025, uh, it will reduce its uh, GHG emissions by 60%. And it's, uh, <clears throat> it's already halfway through by end 2022 with 30%. And then it also announced that it will um, um, reforest some 1,000 hectares of, one th of watershed areas and uh, also that it will uh, plant 580,000 trees. So something like that, more specific. Second, Ayala Land uh, actually set targets way back 2017 that in five years it will achieve carbon neutrality for its commercial properties for scopes one and two. And uh, I, I just want to assure that um, in addition to, to identifying which are scopes one and two, they go to the level of how much in tons of carbon dioxide equivalents are saved or replaced by you know, the use of recycled plastics, the use of uh, recycled steel, um, you know, use of course of uh, green energy. So all of those are, are being done much more than in the past. And I, I, it's, I, and I don't uh, say that that is being done only by the large companies. In fact, I've seen medium-sized companies also at least saying that at, uh, in three years, X percent, 30 percent, 40 percent of my power requirements will come from uh, green energy. And finally, our independent or third-party assessments. It's one thing to set targets. It's one thing to be validated. So I've seen a number of companies actually engage sustainalytics, carbon disclosure project for rating. So they're exposing their climate action programs. Um, and there are also local consultants, by the way, that do third party uh, validations. Ayala Land actually engaged uh, Carbon Check India, which is uh, UN recognized to validate the carbon neutrality measurement. So those are some of the examples. But I'll be the first to say that a lot needs more to be done because the problems are real. And yes, the risks are quite real. Thank you. Thank you, Sharice. And thank you for trailblazing, uh, not just with Manila Water, but with Ayala Land and all the companies that you represent as the independent, as a director. And now I move on to Mr. Thomas Clark. So as the General Counsel of the Asian Development Bank, ADB, can you kindly provide us a snapshot of uh, what climate governance is looking like at the multilateral development banks such as yours and in your client countries? And maybe a little more about why is effective climate risk governance critical in attracting transition finance? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos, for that uh, question. And please let me just start by saying what an immense honor and pleasure it is really for me to be here as part of this really critical, timely discussion. Um, and it's a distinguished panel here. I just want to give big thanks to the organizers that the Institute of Corporate Directors of the Philippines and CCLI and Client Earth. It's really a, a privilege uh, to be here with you. Now, uh, let me start by answering your question and, and just pointing out that you know, we are in a very, you know, unique time here because, you know, climate change is presenting risk that we haven't seen or experienced before. So a lot of this is about projecting into the future, which is inherently, you know, uh, an uncertain thing, but it is certain that there is climate change. And the question is, how do we respond to it, you know, as companies, as legal frameworks and institutions? Um, it's also important to note that 
climate risk governance requires big, big changes, systemic changes. This isn't just about what one company in isolation can do, certainly not about what one director in isolation can do, although it includes that, but it's about what whole systems can do and systemic change. And that's the way ADB looks at it. And one of the things we like to do is to promote and to help our developing member countries to achieve that systemic claim. I'm very, very happy to see that there are member countries, first and foremost, our host country, the Philippines, from delighted to be today and where we're headquartered, taking those steps. And I was very heartened to hear what uh, Commissioner Fernandez mentioned about steps the SEC is taking. It really does put the Philippines, I think, very much at the forefront of a lot of these uh, reforms around disclosure, uh, which I'll come back to. But specifically, let me break your question to two. What's happening at the MDBs and then what's happening in our country? So at the MDBs, uh, ADB has really been at the forefront of this governance transition. Uh, for example, uh, we, along with our fellow MDBs, have agreed on a common methodology for tracking climate mitigation and adaptation finance. And in fact, for several years, we and our peer institutions have been issuing reports on climate finance. We've actually done it annually since 2015. And there's some good news in these reports, I'm happy to report, that uh, according actually to the most recent one issued last October, climate finance committed by major MDBs rose by more than 24% in 2021 versus 2020. Now at the ADB, uh, again, I'd like to think we're at the forefront. Our president, um, Massa, uh, at the uh, COP26 announced that we were increasing our ambition uh, to $100 billion of our own funds by 2030. And we plan to leverage not only our funds and our co-financers, but to crowd in more private capital. And this is really critical as a governance matter because the responsibility is not only to deploy our capital, but to ensure that there is additionality, that there is crowding in of private sector. Because to be quite frank with you, you know, we could take our balance sheet, the balance sheet of the World Bank and all of our sister organizations, the public fisks of all of the developing countries in the region, multiply it by 10 and still not have enough in terms of what's needed to meet uh, the requirements of investing in the climate transition. So it is absolutely critical that we be crowding in private sector investment. And I think the governance frameworks are actually critical to do that. Um, in addition, um, we've out, uh, been doing a lot to operationalize Paris alignment across all of our institutions. And we have a committed time frame uh, for Paris alignment. Actually at COP27, um, all MDBs reported that they're on track to meet their individual Paris alignment commitments for their own investments. And, and we confirm that we are going to be fully Paris aligned in our sovereign operations actually by July of this year. And we're committed to be uh, so aligned in our private sector operations. There, there are a few complexities in terms of the way the private sector operations work, but that will be done by uh, July of 2025. And you know, fundamentally, a lot of governance is about visibility and transparency clear disclosure rules. And we've been talking about that and we've heard from Commissioner Fernandez. Uh, what we've been doing um, in our uh, respect as actually issuers of securities is we've cooperated with the G20 initiative through the Financial Stability Board on the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures. And we actually released our inaugural TCFD report last year. And that's really been the formation uh, of a lot of our efforts to go into clearer disclosure and transparency into that. It's included last year the formation of a distinct climate action coordinating committee uh, so that the senior leadership of ADB is fully invested in achieving Paris alignment and reporting out uh, to our managing director general on all the implementation and coordination of our activities to meet our climate goals. So we'd like to think this is a best practice that we and other MDBs are doing to put ourselves in the same position as other private companies in embracing TCFD disclosures and moving forward. Um, and we've also committed to mainstreaming just transition and social inclusion considerations in all of our relevant policies. And again, at COP27, uh, we launched the Just Transition Support Platform to help strengthen our own work uh, in the just transition space and ensuring that the benefits of the shift to uh, low carbon and resilient economies are shared equally and that there aren't undue burdens imposed disproportionately on vulnerable segments of the population. That's critical because without that just transition, you will not have the sustained political support that's needed to see this through. Let me just very briefly talk about, you know, besides what we're doing, what's happening in countries around the region. Now, I think we already had a terrific uh, overview by Alex on sort of what's happening 
internationally at the global level. I like to just drill a little bit down into the Asia Pacific region. I mean, I think the good news is that 80%, 80% of Asia Pacific countries have declared pledges to have net zero transition uh, targets um, by the year 2050. And this includes uh, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, Fiji. Uh, some other countries are in by 2060, like China, some like India by 2070. But <clears throat> these are very good starts. However, the critical thing is that we need to translate these pledges into real implementation policies, the passing of laws and firm action plans. Now, a few countries in Asia Pacific have passed laws to commit to net zero, the six I mentioned, um, but there are many others that are moving in that space. And again, I'm very heartened to hear what Commissioner Fernandez said about the efforts to really move to uh, likely uh, more mandatory reporting on um, making mandatory uh, it, to comply or sustain and other provisions like that, very important. Uh, we also work through our law and policy reform program to assist our, our DMCs. We were actually critical in helping Fiji pass that law that committed to Paris alignment, and they now have a clear legal framework for that. So basically supporting through advocacy and technical assistance with our, our member countries to ensure that their legal frameworks are keeping it up. And finally, I have to mention the private sector. Uh, it's also critical that they are going through a similar journey. Now, they're at different stages if you look across different countries in the region. But I think throughout this process, you know, companies and financial institutions have been looking at what's the appropriate climate governance arrangements? What should they look like? And, and there's a backdrop of an evolving legal and regulatory environment. I'm very happy to see the work that, you know, the Commonwealth Group has done in sort of helping to unpack that and see what's really needed here. So those are some of the quick um, you know, answers. I really look forward to you know, continued discussion on how we can advance that agenda forward. Thank you. Well, we definitely look forward to continued discussions on this very important topic. And we're very delighted that ADB shares the same advocacy and that we are all aligned towards net zero and all the climate initiatives that we share. Uh, nonetheless, we'd like to ask someone from the private sector who's been walking the talk over the years. So Eric Francia, of course, the managing director of ASEN Energy Group of the Ayala Corporation. So my question um, in further, uh, further to this discussion. So some companies do consider sustainability and environmental initiatives as expensive exercises that could reduce companies' profitability and therefore sometimes shy away from them. You've overseen ASEN for a while and committed, you are committed to attaining a net zero by 2050, as mentioned by Thomas Clark. Uh, we are aligned in that. And as recently when it disclosed its transition, you disclosed your transition plan to attain that goal. How do you see climate change as providing opportunities to increase shareholder value? Uh, thanks, uh, Charlie, and a pleasant uh, afternoon to everyone. Uh, yeah, I think uh, ASEN is a great uh, case study uh, in terms of uh, classic uh, energy transition. It was not easy. Uh, just as a background, we're a new player in the power sector. We started with zero megawatts, started in 2011. And at the time, Ayala, who uh, has always been at the forefront of sustainability, had big ambitions to focus on sustainable power. But at the time, uh, it, renewables just couldn't scale up in a country like Philippines, we, the country needed reliable and affordable power. And unfortunately, we were discussing this with Pete earlier that feed-in tariff had to be so high and, and uh, too punitive that you couldn't really scale it up. So our first five years was really focused on building thermal plants. I was the bad guy who got Ayala into um, uh, coal, the business of coal, I hope. There's a lot of lawyers here. In Client or I, I hope I don't get sued uh, for that. <laughs> um, but I will plead guilty that I was the one who encouraged Ayala to get into uh, coal. And we built uh, over a 1,000 megawatts, which was our goal uh, in our first five years, when able, because that was what the country needed back then. Not gas was too expensive, renewables was too expensive and unreliable. It was a hard choice, but we had to do it and do it in a responsible manner. Uh, in 2016, uh, we saw the tide turning. Uh, the groundswell on ESG was becoming increasingly mainstream as opposed to a niche or a policy by exclusion of certain sectors, but more integrated into one's uh, strategy. Renewables were getting more and more competitive. Um, and ironically, coal plants were fetching at a significant 
value uh, because of market share grab uh, and consolidation in the industry. So we made that uh, choice. Uh, it was a pivotal period for Ayala and AC Energy as we were known back then, uh, AC and today, uh, to <clears throat> redefine our market from being a Philippine power focused uh, player or company <clears throat> to a regional renewables market. We didn't mind seeding market share in the Philippines uh, we didn't have to be the biggest power player in the Philippines, but we wanted to be the biggest in renewables in the Philippines and across the region. That was not an easy decision, uh, by the way. Now, now it's like saying, oh, obviously that's the right answer. Back then it wasn't. Our renewables in 2016 was only 80 megawatts, 8-0, of our 1,000 megawatt plus portfolio. Coal was 92%. So when we initially uh, recommended to the board we of this strategic pivot from Philippine power market to regional renewables, the board wasn't unanimous in the beginning. You know, we're going to divest and value realize significant thermal investments that would have stable, significant cash flows, you know, in the next few years, over the next decades, contracted plant and so forth, a nice cash uh, uh, profile and invest all those proceeds to renewables, which was still expensive. It was built on expectation of competitiveness over time, technological advancements, ability to scale up and so forth. It was not an easy decision, So, uh, but we got it over the hump anyway. Um, it's not an overnight divestment of coal and precision to renewables. We just committed to that in 2018-2019, but we uh, started the shift in 2016-17. So I have sympathy for um, incumbent companies. It's not an easy decision because in this part of the world, coal and gas still have a role to play over the next foreseeable decades. This is an energy transition. It will not happen overnight. But we, the way we mitigated that was we believe we had what it takes to participate outside of the Philippine shores, not because we want to leave Philippines. We're still a very much a significant player here. But that's the only way I could justify to the board that we can still achieve scale and impact if we went beyond the Philippine shores because I couldn't sell that proposition of focusing on renewables in 2016 in the Philippines. It was just not going to scale up and, and, and have uh, the impact that Ayala uh, wants to do. So I think that's really a lesson. Learned. It's going to be much harder for incumbents with three, four, five thousand 5,000 megawatts of conventional and just say overnight, you know what, we're gonna do what ASEN did. We're gonna get out of coal or gas and go all in on renewables. It's easier said than done. And therefore, I, 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 I'm happy to discuss this later and that's why, um, uh, Thomas, I, we, we, we do support and we would like to really uh, uh, acknowledge and thank ADB's um, inspiration and push for this just energy transition with the ETM, the energy transition mechanism because that's another pain point. <clears throat> so ASEN, um, while we focused uh, ASEN now on becoming a pure 100% renewables platform, and Joyce, by the way, I have to correct, uh, update your, your data. We're now 4,000 megawatts of renewables, not 2,000. Uh, I'll be remiss if I didn't uh, correct that. <laughs> um, we'll update uh, whatever information. Um, so the, my pain point was uh, we still had SLTEC up until last year, which is a 246 megawatt legacy coal plant uh, uh, within uh, ASEN. And my dilemma was the shareholders, my shareholders were, uh, uh, a lot of ESG-oriented shareholders wanted to invest in ASEN but couldn't because of the presence of we owned a coal fire generation. So we decided, okay, let's run a process to divest the coal plant. There are shareholders, again, ESG-oriented shareholders who say, okay, but if you divest that, you will just pass on the problem to somebody else. The emissions are still there. And worse, you know, if you divest it to an unlisted company, they will have less transparency, maximize the, the economics and so forth, and run it longer than you would. So I said, so I had a major dilemma. If I keep it, you won't invest in me. If I sell it, you'll say I'm irresponsible. If I shut it down, my shareholders will hang me, uh, destroying shareholder value. So when we saw ADB pushing for this so-called energy transition mechanism, 
wherein there's a, a, a group of investors who would be willing to fund coal plants with the aim of retiring them earlier than their typical operating life and transitioning that to clean technology, that was an aha moment for us, a light bulb moment. And we said, I want to do this, and I will do this soon. The, the struggle was to do a, 400, a 246 megawatt, uh, $300 million enterprise value <clears throat> was too small for international or multilaterals to, to, to go to their board and have a carve out on their policies. But it was, uh, the, the silver lining is it was a good enough size that the local institutions here in the Philippines would be able to manage. And we prioritized uh, the initiative to do it uh, as fast as possible and be the first in the world to help the, the likes of ADB, the World Bank, and so forth, that a just energy transition on early coal retirement is possible. It can be done. And we're ha very happy to say that uh, in November of last year, we reached financial close with the help of uh, the banking institutions here, RCBC and Bank of the Philippine Islands, as well as the insurance companies, GSIS, uh, Insular Life, uh, and many other smaller uh, investors, we were able to, to pull it off. And, and now it's a template we're um, uh, uh, discussing with Peter. Uh, you know, uh, this is uh, talked about, and we're very happy to share our experience because there's a lot of nuances and the devil is in the details. But again, I think the key message here is we're hoping that the uh, early retirement and methodical um, planning for the shutdown or retirement of coal plants and transition really get scaled up uh, and, and embraced by the power plant uh, owners. This is not an overnight. What's important is to set a roadmap to draw a line in the sand, have a deadline, give ourselves an internal deadline, and then the, the entire industry can plan uh, around that to have an orderly and just uh, transition, not only for the transition of technology and supply and demand balance, but also working with the different stakeholders, the community, the jobs, uh, the people, to transition them to green jobs, uh, and, and the stakeholders, the Department of Energy for energy planning and so forth. So I think there's a lot of lesson learned here. I can go on forever, but uh, I, I just think it's an exciting space. It's groundbreaking, and we're, not, we're never going to stop uh, pioneering uh, this area. Well, thank you very much, and we are delighted to hear your, your groundbreaking story. And, you know, ASEN is walking the talk, to say. And it's, it's like a marathon, isn't it, after almost 10 years with ASEN. Um, you've been dealing with the Department of Energy, our previous National Renewable Energy Board, the uh, trustee, Pete Maniego, is here, and he knows, we, know, we know this story, but it's, it's, it's a story in itself. So having said that, thank you very much. Joyce, yeah, I believe you have. A, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm very happy, Eric, to be corrected. I'm, 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 I'm so sorry, Joyce and uh, Charlie, but can I just one, uh, one because I got carried away. Let yeah, me no, now answer sure, the question sure. on this share is value, shareholder yeah. value creation. I think Good it question. did translate to shareholder value creation. In fact, uh, the market does not look at the short-term profits. It does, right? Quarterly and so forth. But the market is smart enough. There's enough smart investors out there that look at long-term. Um, potential and if you look at the multiples the valuation between this is globally not just in the Philippines for renewable focused company the EV EBITDA multiple on average is about 15 times ASEN is above average yeah. because of our um, steep growth trajectory whereas conventional power is high single digit nine times right so right then and there there is already a recognition uh, among investors of a premium that is, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that these renewable companies uh, um, uh, deserve. And also there's just a lot of, not with saying the fact um, that Thomas mentioned, there's, you need to multiply it by 10 and it's still not gonna be enough. The, the, the fact is notwithstanding that, there's still a lot of ESG oriented funds searching for that outlet, investment outlet, a lot of them private, um, uh, right? And there's just a dearth of authentic, genuine, high-quality investment platforms or opportunities. And that's why I think uh, I'll segue later on, uh, help the facilitator. The capital markets has a lot to play, and we're just uh, proud that uh, others followed on 
renewable focused uh, platforms tapping now the, the capital markets. And I think that's an interesting discussion as well. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that. And I'm very happy, Eric, to be corrected, if only to know that it's double the capacity already in such a short time. And don't worry, Client Earth is not out to sue anyone in this space. We're very much in the business right now of building climate leaders from across the different stakeholders, such as yourselves, uh, the, the, represent, the, the sectors that you're presenting here. So you're right, it's, it's great to see ASEN as showing an early case study of how it may be difficult, but if the senior management and the board gives the target, it will give the rest of the company the confidence to confront all of the challenges, maybe go through a lot of expenses at first, but then create long-term shareholder value because 15 times EBITDA versus nine times is not a joke. So I would like to turn now to Alex. You're an ESG leader, and also you're a part of the Management Association of the Philippines. So could you tell us how do you see senior managers in companies navigating balancing company profits with good governance and the very difficult challenge of climate risk. And in particular, if you could share with us your views considering that MAPS Focus includes industries which are particularly exposed to climate risk such as agriculture and manufacturing. Yeah, I think there's a, a forthcoming game changer and uh, Dean uh, Cesar Villanueva made this study about the loss, but there's a, um, sustainability reporting standards uh, coming, and there's a Philippine equivalent of that being studied now by the uh, Philippine Sustainability Review uh, Committee, and it's coming out on um, maybe uh, Gen January 2024. And I'm saying it's, uh, it's game changing because while sustainability reports are only required of listed companies, this uh, re uh, disclosure requirement can be required uh, of all companies maybe, almost all companies. And this is very important because whenever you disclose something, that's the beginning of uh, compliance or improvement in your uh, initiatives. And I, I, really, I really like that because, um, well, firstly, it's concentrating on climate-related risk, those that have financial impact in the financial statements, and those that impact on the value of the company or the enterprise value. And when you're talking about enterprise value, every kind of reputational risk impacts on uh, enterprise value. Um, so in the entire supply chain, uh, if they are not covered by the Code of Corporate Governance uh, by the uh, SEC, because they're not listed, they will be required to make these disclosures later on, which will be very relevant. And as already been discussed, investors already look at the ESG practices and make it uh, a factor in their go no go decision on whether to invest or partner uh, partner with this um, uh, partnering with these companies are concerned. I think uh, something which was not probably highlighted here is the fact that you know cl client Earth, for instance, so for example, uh, in, in UK they they, they sued uh, an oil company, a class action suit, um, apparently for for the, uh, well, because of their view that it's not going to align with the Paris uh, Agreement uh, in time. I mean, their transition will not align in time. And it's, it's not the fact that, uh, you know, whether there's ground or not for that suit, but, but look at what's happening there. It can be duplicated elsewhere, and uh, uh, Dutch, company, Dutch oil company has been sued as well uh, on, on, the same, uh, on the same ground. Board of directors can be sued for non-compliance uh, or for uh, poor governance in respect of climate change issues. And you don't even need to look at certain laws to see whether there are grounds to be, uh, that are violated because we keep on talking about climate change uh, when in fact the, maybe what we're really talking about here is human rights because the, <laughs> the earth doesn't really need us. It's the humans that, that need the earth. So ultimately, what we're talking about here is human rights. And whenever we can prove that there's danger to human life or human health or human welfare or quality of life, then that's a, a potential uh, legal ground uh, for, for action. So there's, uh, there's, there's a lot uh, happening 
in so far as examples around the world, um, and so far as forthcoming um, reporting um, requirements are concerned. And I think that this will change the behavior. But whenever there's reporting, there's also the danger of greenwashing. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, the uh, to combat greenwashing is uh, sustainability assurance and not plugging our services. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the very essence of it. It brings credibility, brings predictability. And if investors believe the financials and uh, the reports there, then they will have more confidence in investing. That is certainly a very necessary industry. And you're right, because disclosure and transparency keep directors and companies honest. And increasingly, that's what everybody wants, right? That's what markets want. That's what consumer wants and consumers want. And as you said, reputational risks are very high. And a lot of companies, not just the big ones, aren't only concerned about uh, be, about substantially or minimally complying with the law, but how they can create the largest shareholder value for their own company. So, so keeping them honest and also setting targets and disclosing these targets and then later on measuring their performance against these targets is really crucial. And now because of all of these target settings and regulators looking at what's going on internationally in the space of climate governance, I would like to turn to the represented, representative of regulators. So Roel, you're with the Philippine Stock Exchange. From a regulator's perspective, could you share with us how companies should be considering climate as a material financial risk and how companies have been identifying and disclosing these risks actually in their submissions so far to the PSE? Thank you, Joyce, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I was listening to Eric you know, and, and uh, Eric, I remember early this year the government also uh, fundraised no? uh, green bonds. And I was very uh, surprised and very happy because the rate at which they were able to fundraise around $1.25 billion for 25 years was 5.5%. It's a very tight spread. Considering that now, if you look at where the BVAL rates are, probably that's going to hit just the one month rates. This is 25 years. No? So it's, as Eric mentioned, it's the long game. It's a long term plan. And anytime you talk to corporates about the business side of it, and they go to the exchange, for example, to fundraise and be a, probably do a preferred share offering or common share offering, uh, it's very integral that they look at how they can achieve their price targets. And that's a function of a lot of uh, nuances. No? And that's going to have to be a matter of fully disclosing the good, the bad, the prospects, give and take the forward-looking statement that they have to be wary of as well, but really making sure the investors understand their narrative or their story. And the climate risk that may be material could be a very important criterion as investors price risks. So um, the board of directors of issuers would be happy if they're able to get attractive prices, for example, uh, whether it's for an IP or follow-on, um, allowing them to really finance these very important initiatives. And that's going to be um, reflected in the registration statement that will have to be cleared with our regulators, Securities and Exchange Commission. On our end also, it's important that we support um, initiatives, for example, where our renewable energy does not have track record, but may see the need to do a fundraising opportunity and tap on public funds. So that's, that's not an easy proposition. You, you, you have someone with no track record, but now going to the public domain. Um, and we have relaxed uh, with the clearance from the SEC our rules, for example, for renewable energy to tap the public markets without um, the requisite track record. So that's, that's one way of incentivizing companies to not just look at project financing, for example, or maybe just a traditional fixed income offering to support these projects because there's always a benefit when you have skin in the game for the public um, to be part of these RE companies. And on a bigger plane for the government also, that's a very strong political message no? um, that the corporates that are, are weighing in also on, on our NDCs. No? We have the nationally determined contributions back in 2021, and it's really for our, for our um, corporates to really work with government. So we're part of that as, as an SRO, self-regulatory organization. We facilitate, for example, if there's important disclosures that need to be integrated within a primary offering the first time that they're going to tap the public markets, then that's very much um, not just a checkpoint, really, but that's 
As I said, it's a core underpinning of when you tap the public markets. It's merit based. It's not merit based regulation, but you want to make sure that you're fully, fairly disclosing all of these positives and the negatives. No? Because in the end, the price discovery feature should weave its magic. When you look at the likes of ASEN or SM, for example, the other corporates, for them to also realize that the public is listening to what they're sharing, right? And that's a that's what we look for. We, we look for standardization of information, reliability of information, really clarity and consistency. Otherwise, the data could not even be uh, integrated and processed. And you see a lot of funds right now um, um, also looking to harmonize all of those data points with the power of you know, supercomputers and all that, AI, what have you. But if the information there is uh, greenwashed or greenhushed, whatever we want to call it, that's not going to make full use for let's say an ESG or sustainable, sustainable uh, fund. And in the end, the market would not be as probably as uh, attractive for a lot of funds. Because there's a lot of funds, except that what we need now to, we need now to roll our sleeves and make sure that, um, you know, we're not talking about going to the supermarket to buy non-fat milk. We don't know what non-fat means, right? Mm -hmm. You look at the label, and there's tons of non-fat milk out there. When you talk about ESG related public offerings, we also have to look at the label, and that's the disclosure aspect of it. Mm -hmm. It's it's probably a case where we're still crawling, I have to say, mm -hmm. um, before we learn to walk and eventually to run, but we're working closely with our regulators and, and, and the Climate Change Commission on my end to make sure that we're aligned with the government, mm -hmm. um, knowing fully well that this is all you know, going to be an interconnected mm -hmm. um, systemic issue for everyone. Yeah, thank you. And 75% emission reduction target is no joke. So disclosures, the different sustainability streams and levels of green are what investors are increasingly looking at. So Yes, this would be a fitting transition to now attorney Alex Cooper. For Alex, of course, no. Talking about finance and disclosures, the task force for climate finance disclosures, DCFD, of course, is a um, what do they mean for companies and the standard care of directors who need to comply with these uh, disclosures? And maybe your opinion or your thoughts regarding how it is applied in, the, in relation to, uh, in the global direction and the global perspective, Alex. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I'll be brief because I've spoken about this already uh, and I want to hear more from the other panelists. Uh, but I also think that a lot of what I would say has been covered by the other panelists. Uh, lots of people have spoken about the opportunities which are present and investors are looking for these disclosures. Um, I also think that the TCFD provides a real, um, a real touchstone for companies looking to provide this information in a way which investors find useful. Uh, and so for companies around the world to be converging on these standards as a way of providing investors with the information which they need to make these investment decisions both means that there are colossal opportunities for companies uh, and also that uh, investors have the information which they need to make those capital decisions. Um, so I think the, the side of one, a significant part of the, of, the, um, of the duty is the opportunity and, the best, and, and how that relates to the best interest of the company. Uh, the TCFD provides a framework which directors can use to ensure that they are not just avoiding risks, but also maximizing opportunity for their company. In terms of risks, uh, the, so the other side of that, uh, I think it's important that the TCFD have uh, targets for, have disclosures around uh, quantitative emissions, uh, as well as targets, and as I mentioned previously, the identification, management, and mitigation of those risks. What that allows in, in, company, in countries and companies around the world is for boards to communicate to their shareholders how they are going to manage this, these problems as they come up and what they are going to do to move their company into a position where it will survive and thrive in the transition. Uh, and investors, as I've mentioned, are keen to see these, but also it keeps, as Mr. Cabrera said, it keeps the companies honest. They have to be, if you are telling your investors that you are doing one thing and you are not, then obviously you are exposed to greenwashing risk and the board of directors could be exposed to the risk of uh, personal liability for failing to manage the company. If you tell people that there are climate risks and that you're going to do something about them and then you ignore them, uh, firstly, reputationally, it's a huge issue. And secondly, legally, you start to expose yourself quite a lot. And I think, um, 
while it's important to acknowledge that there are legal liabilities that could arise for board members, uh, the, as I said, the, the framework, the legal framework is very broad, but directors should be using this opportunity to disclose how they are managing these risks as a way of adhering to best practices. In doing that, you're going to avoid not only the risk that you may eventually be found liable, but also the risk of getting sued and the risk of reputational damage. So it's not just about doing the bare minimum required by law to avoid um, having to pay a fine. It's about what you can do as directors to ensure that you're meeting your duties to the full and that you're keeping your investors happy and navigating your company through uncertain times. Thank you, Alex. And TCFD is indeed becoming very popular in the Philippines. And, and we've seen reports that it's had the highest uptake in terms of sustainability reporting. And Dean Assessor, so we've heard from the SEC about considerations to make sustainability reporting mandatory. So could you tell us how companies and the directors governing these companies could prepare for increased reporting standards and also the fast tracking of the ability within regulators to, to really meaningfully assess these, dis these disclosures, the reports, to see whether companies are, are giving, in giving investors the correct information to decide whether they support the company or not. That's a loaded question, and thank you from ICD and the firm of Alex. That is, uh, it's for, time for us to plug our uh, specialization and our expertise, right? Um, sustainability reporting is uh, very technical, so to speak. You need a lot of scientific data. You have to work not only with uh, compliance officers, but uh, engineers and, and climate scientists and things like that. To be able to monitor and evaluate the risk that a company faces uh, in, in, the, in terms of the global risks that are there, right? So the company, you expect that the companies will spend a lot of money trying to get best expertise, uh, assurance uh, uh, profitable, uh, assurance from firms like that of uh, uh, attorney Alex's in order to be able to comply with this, right? So in answer to that, therefore, uh, the answer is uh, basically get good compliance officers, get the board to be trained on, on the importance of sustainability reporting, uh, uh, get uh, uh, obtain the services of uh, firms that do are able to train the board on the meaning, repercussions, and the point of all the sustainability reporting, and that compliance officers they get to, to know this uh, inter globally recognized uh, platforms and standards, right? And therefore, we, in our opinion, we had said, once the SEC makes this mandatory, and once uh, uh, the PCRC standards are put in place, then there's a game changer, because it not only covers the uh, publicly held companies, but also many other companies that are not within the coverage of the code of, of governance for publicly held companies, right? Uh, we look at this as a warning to everybody that they must, to, to companies, that they must take their, their ESG obligations uh, in reporting them, reporting them with good value to, to the highest level. And uh, therefore, it, sh it, would, it should send what we call uh, shivers in the hearts of directors of publicly listed company that they stand uh, naked if they don't do this well, right? And that seems to be the message. And that's why we're always badgering SEC to make it mandatory already, right? Because we think that the, the reforms will get faster. But what we're hearing here, actually, the, the opinion is, is based on the duties and obligations. When in fact, the key to it all, and it seems that is also what the Climate Change uh, Act says, it is a uh, uh, as attorney Alex has said, it concentrates more on the duties to act in the best interest. I think that there is uh, not only in the Philippines, but around the world, boards of directors and manage, uh, manage, managers, management of companies are trying to find the best ways and means to be good corporate citizens in terms of the climate change that is, uh, that is uh, upon the earth. Therefore, 
Making this sustainability reporting mandatory, therefore, is something that allows them to spend time and resources towards not only being able to do them, but to actually change the pattern, change the dynamics within the corporation themselves to be able to do so, as in the case of, uh, of Accent, as demonstrated so clearly, right? And therefore, that's what they're willing to do. It's not as if uh, it sends shivers in the heart. It, it actually motivates them to be the forefront uh, of uh, this climate change risk evaluation. It also gives them the opportunity to really, aside from the risks which are about going to happen anyway, right? It takes, gives them the opportunities that seem to be allayed. Uh, to us today, there's so many opportunities that this danger has auth uh, allowed to companies which would not have been there before. Right? And, and that's the message. And that's just moving it forward, so to speak. Yeah, definitely. And so directors training and sustainability, hiring the correct experts, and then contextualizing that into their actual business operation, because it, it's the companies themselves who understand their industry and their supply chain. So they need to, mo to merge these two pieces of information together to make the right decisions. So I think that uh, uh, Cesar has referred to Alex. So Charlie, would yes, you like to? Yes, if I may, yeah. You know, having these sustainability reports as a mandatory, and you know, hopefully you go into more standardized uh, versions uh, as part of the uh, requirements uh, will come into play. But let's get back to what uh, Alex has mentioned earlier as well, and trying to put this together. Uh, reality is there's still a lot of greenwashing, a lot of uh, misleading, even false statements, and it's a key concern in disclosures. No? Let's take a step back and maybe you can share your views as how senior management can work with boards to ensure that climate risks are properly assessed, managed, and, breast, and that best practices um, in ensuring accurate and meaningful disclosures are applied. So, Alex? Yeah, well, firstly, uh, you have to be legally compliant. So if there's a particular law that's uh, applicable, you should follow that uh, minimum requirement of the law. For instance, now there's an expanded producer's responsibility act. You have to uh, comply with that. But secondly, after complying with the good practice, you have to implement as well uh, best practices. And, and for instance, uh, in, instead of complying with the, merely complying with the collection of uh, plastic waste from your uh, packaging, you need to uh, um, engage in research and development to improve your, uh, the, the packaging of your product so that it doesn't produce uh, too much waste or it's easy to recover the waste uh, coming from that. So I, I think, uh, yes, indeed the board and the management should, should work together, but more critical here really is the board. Uh, the tone from the top is important or it will be uh, radical about it, the instructions from the top. Because who will not follow an instruction from the top if that uh, means that they will lose their jobs? And then you need to hire the right people uh, to, to get that done. Well, thank you. Maybe I should add to the best practice, aside from engaging with PricewaterhouseCoopers for your sustainability <laughs> reports, aside from ICD, where we are partners, right? We are not competitors. We're all in the same journey in this systematic change. Yep. And we all have a lot to learn. Yes, of course. And we've heard from Alex that we need instructions from the top. So, Teresa, what issues and gaps have you seen arising when companies navigate between just complying with minimum standards, reporting obligations, and actually employing proper stewardship and best practices? Well, actually, in ICD as well as in the other companies, we don't just advocate compliance, but actually uh, really commitment to good governance. Going beyond compliance, we have to inject it into our DNA. And you know, the best way to do that is really by relating it to the business strategies or the business model of the company. I think ASEN, uh, I hope I was uh, supporting you in the board, Eric, when I was there, <laughs> that, uh, you know, ASEN has already mentioned that it did help in the launch of their green bonds. Well, Ayala Land is one of those in the elite uh, Dow Jones Sustainability Index because of uh, this ESG practices. And so it, it, it is the, the business value also of those moves that also count, no? Because what we really want is to ingrain it in, within the organization that, that they embrace it and they make it part 
of the business strategy and the risk avoidance measures. Uh, you had to ask what is the value to a property developer of a building being lead certified or having more greens in the development? What is the value, for instance, to a business resort for protecting the um, the ecosystem, the, the mangroves, you know, the aqua life? There is a business value to this. So it's really beyond just uh, compliance. And then finally, I think uh, just a final word is that there has to be, just like any of your business programs and strategies, there has to be a concrete plan. There has to be top management support. There has to be an organization, maybe a person or a unit that will actually do the, the things that needed to be done relative to the ESG. There has to be funding, resources required. And finally, there should be measures of success. So those are the things that probably uh, the corporation should address in order to concretize the plans towards the sustainability programs. If I may touch on another side, and I'd like to ask Thomas Clark with your experience as, as ADB, uh, in ADB regarding the judiciaries and your experience in you know, providing knowledge and trainings about emerging climate change disputes, how are corporate uh, how are the courts shaping climate governance and how important is it in your point of view uh, to have access to the courts? Thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, it's critically important. I mean, to be brief, um, you know, if you look around, you'll see a lot of the very positive moves that's happening in the regulatory space. And I, I, I just want to say how important it was the comments that Eric made about, you know, recognizing the need for, you know, appropriate transition standards. You know, this isn't a, a, a I'll, I'll say a phrase that was very common a few weeks ago at the World Bank uh, IMF Spring Meetings in Washington was, you can't divest your way to net zero. And I think that's kind of a good paraphrase of what you were saying, uh, because it's, it's just impossible. You, you, know, you need money in order to responsibly retire you know, uh, assets. And regulations are coming out to do that, and it has to be, um, it has to be harmonized. Uh, I think we have a lot of problem with disharmonized regimes, but you know they're, they're, the G20 working group has come out with standards on transition financing. So I think the um, you know regulatory regime is going to evolve, hopefully toward more harmonization. Um, you know we also, I mean, the EU has a, uh, a director a directive now which is going to require transition planning to be disclosed. All of those things will promote. But the bottom line is that will go forward, but it's not going to be universal. You know, the rules aren't going to cover everything, and they're not going to cover everything in every jurisdiction, which is, I think, what brings us squarely to the question you asked, is that, you know, when there is an absence of a comprehensive and harmonized regulatory regime, where does that leave you? With no law? No. It leaves you with litigation. It leaves you with, um, you know, what the courts say it is. And that's exactly, I think, the problem that many countries and companies are recognizing is that, you know, there needs to be harmonization and sharing of best practices among the judiciary. And so we have been investing a lot at ADB in terms of working with judiciaries to help judiciaries, particularly in some of our developing member countries that do not have the substantial you know, resources uh, of, of judiciaries in, in highly developed uh, uh, countries to like share global best practices, to develop common jurisprudence. Um, we actually published a four volume set called coming soon to a court near you, and it's all about climate litigation. And actually, you know, while you might think, oh, climate litigation, that sounds like something that's very active in Brussels or, you know, the U.S. where they have lots of litigators, Asia Pacific, maybe not so much. Au contraire, actually, there's a lot of climate litigation, and some of the courts, including here in the Philippines, have been very progressive in some of their cases, recognizing natural uh, rights and some of the writs that exist under Philippine law. Uh, many of the courts in the region have been embracing um, either constitutional provisions uh, about right to life and right to clean environment and imposing them as a means to address uh, climate injustice. Uh, many of them are looking to international treaties such as Paris uh, and finding in those international treaties which have been ratified by their countries certain obligations. And so where the legislature or the regulators have been less active, courts have often picked up the role so I think it's critically important for all stakeholders here, certainly for international development institutions, to play our role as capacity builders and thought leaders and to help judiciaries 
basically develop the capacity to you know, pull together from evolving global best practices what the standard should be, and we're doing that. By the way, I have to say, you know, being here in Manila, that uh, we're absolutely honored that the Philippine Supreme Court has asked uh, ADB, and particularly our Office of General Counsel, to develop a mandatory curriculum for Philippine law schools uh, through the Legal Education Board that we're working on, and it's really our distinct honor to do that, so that every lawyer, you know, when they go to law school, part of the curriculum has to be to learn about climate justice, to learn about the developing standards, because that will be a huge part of what they do. And I guess finally, I just say that, you know, what does this mean for access? It means that, you know, we need to make sure we're ensuring access to the courts, because until the regulatory scheme becomes, you know, omnipresent uh, and comprehensive, which it isn't yet, you know, inevitably legislation is going to play uh, some role, but not all, and litigation will pick up the slack. And so we need to make sure that access is assured so that climate injustices, which are cognizable under international law or under constitutional provisions, have a place to be recognized and remedies, you know, can be given. So a lot of work to do in that area. Yeah, definitely. And that provide all of the, the comments that we've heard from our panelists today have provided such rich seeds for discussion, but I'm afraid that Sora has said that we need to wrap up already. So I think that we'll just end with one more question uh, so that we could also ha give the panelists a bit of a break since we've, we've been sitting here for an hour already. So, well, just before we close, Tom has clearly said that in the absence of legislation or law is litigation. And we know that policies, regulations could also be stepping stones towards legislation. And we've heard that in some jurisdictions, regulators have adopted climate-related rules on governance or director training, for example, as has happened in Singapore, following the publication of similar legal opinions on directors' duties and climate risk. What do you think are the prospects of something like this happening in the Philippines? Because I think that's what a lot of our participants are really interested in moving forward. Thank you. I think if you're a publicly listed company, the materiality of information would dictate the nature of the disclosure. It's not optional. If there is a, an exposure of the company relating to climate risk, then it's not an option for them not to disclose. It's all, we're on a mandatory disclosure regime for the public markets. Now, if you want to dissect that further, for example, if you're a mining company and you are to engage a what we call a competent person to verify what you cannot see underground, there will be a report and we already integrated that there is an ESG component to that. So that's mandatory. Um, and the mining companies know that. And this has been approved by the SEC. And this is patterned after the standards all over the world. So that's the core. There's a mandatory disclosure for material information. And it's always the frontliners, the compliance officers. It's not the board, but the compliance officers mm -hmm. who will make the judgment call. Should I disclose or not? And I'm talking about a company which is being created on a real-time basis, right? It's different if I'm going to the public markets and you know, I'll engage with underwriters. Then there's a lot of gatekeepers who will help me make sure that the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. But whenever you look at a company that's already publicly traded, it's a mandatory disclosure. That's the first. Now, should we come up with bespoke regulations for, let's say, sustainability uh, related indices or probably that's something that is required of the market um i say that because for example um there there's the msci out there and the way to go is it's an aspiration for philippine corporates to be part let's say of the climate action index low carbon index of msci why it impacts their price you could see that it's really price sensitive therefore it's material right no doubt about that but i guess um what exchange together with the Securities Commission can come up with would be guidelines really to make sure that in terms of the metrics, these are the metrics and we're working with our ASEAN exchanges. We have common metrics by the way uh, with respect to the E, the S and the G um, and we've published this. So that will have to be um, intersected with their mandatory obligation to disclose what is price sensitive and that takes a lot of judgment call. So we always say when, you, when you're in doubt, disclose. Um, why? Because it will haunt you later on. When you later on are exposed, let's say, to climate mitigation, then why did you not disclose that before? That was discussed extensively in the board. Um, actions, mitigants were not fully disclosed to the public. Therefore, there's a lot of uh, potential litigation, especially if you're 
traded also cross-border, and we see that for some of our PLCs. So um, the long and short of it, I think it will really help if we, there are guidances out there, um, but that does not mean that it's not mandatory for you to disclose what is price-sensitive material information. And I think our publicly listed companies are very aware of that, except that when you look at the discourse with respect to ESG, sometimes it's really becoming too complicated. So our goal is to engage with the stakeholders on how to probably make it more understandable for a lot of them, because I know it costs no, um, for purposes of building, let's say, uh, a building that has uh, not just LEED certification, but really um, some of our corporates, when, it's, when there's floods, their malls are the ev evacuation center. It takes you know, extra 10% in your budget to make sure that these are suitable for evacuation centers purposes. Um, resilience and all that, disaster recovery. But I guess um, our aspiration is one and the same. No? Um, number one, that really there's, um, I'd say, standardization of information. Um, allows us also to make sure that for purposes of companies who want to be part of indices on the ESG, that we speak their language. Otherwise, we're not communicating with the uh, investor base. That's, that's going to be difficult. Um, second, that in terms of consciousness, we know that everyone's aware of ESG as a very material, um, probably existential risk for everyone. But as applied, as, as uh, Mr. Nuesa mentioned, you have to align it with your primary purpose. No? Um, because there are opportunities. And that has to also be disclosed. If there are opportunities because, let's say, you're in the, uh, um, let's say in the manufacturing sector, if I can go with uh, alternative means to manufacture and really decarbonize my process, then that's something that you really have to disclose properly. Why? Because that benefits your price formation also. When I talk to my uh, um, institutionals, and they're going to cut me some slack. No? And, and if it's a transition-based story, all the more. Um, you have to make known what are your targets. And hopefully, the uh, pricing, if it's a bond, would, would be favorable at certain, price, at certain points based on the contractual terms in your uh, public offering. So in a nutshell, really, when, when you look at um, the ESG um, challenges, the risks and the opportunities, it behooves the company, of course, under the guidance of the board of directors, through management, to make sure that it translate that into something that's understandable by the end user. The end user is the investors and the stakeholders, plus the government and the regulators, right? But probably more because it's an ecosystem that will also bring back, right, the views of the public. And that's where markets play a central role, as Mr. Francia mentioned. Because without those markets, it's, it's, it's all going to be probably bilateral transactions. And sometimes information asymmetry would not work for purposes of getting the story out there. But anytime you're looking at the capital markets, the public markets, you're looking at price discovery at its best. And that's where we're at. We're, we're working with stakeholders to make sure that they are able to um, translate their story. And the markets hopefully would also view them favorably. Great, thank you so much. And that was such a rich discussion and a nice way to wrap up the panel. So we started today hearing about the climate crisis, but it is great to hear that the private sector has so many opportunities and a lot of food for thought about what they can do to contribute to climate action, starting with setting targets, being comfortable with it being a difficult journey, confronting these challenges, disclosing to the markets what they are planning to do and how climate affects their risks, uh, sorry, their businesses, especially if climate risks are existential to their company, and then planning forward to make sure that they can navigate their companies through this crisis and come out still profitable. So I think that draws this to the close, but I'm sure that we have a lot of directors in the room who probably have a lot of questions. Just to give the panelists a bit of a breather, we're going to do a, a different kind of structure. So we'll go through closing remarks first so that we can get a bit of water to the panelists. And then we'll open the floor for your questions. So Sara, over to you. Thank you, everybody, for such a rich discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Attorney Joyce. Um, and those were indeed valuable and insightful sharings from our distinguished panelists. So thank you so much, everyone. And of course, thank you so much as well for our moderators for the uh, wonderful handling of the panel discussion. Um, 
uh, we'll ask the, uh, everyone to please stay on stage. Um, we will be accepting questions from our audience later. But before that, let me call to the center Attorney Ruel A. Refran, um, Chief Operating Officer of the Philippine Stock Exchange for the closing remarks. I, I, can I just stay here with my the panel just to uh, contextualize everything? So, no problem. So, well, it's, it's really a privilege for us to, you know, kick off the discussion. And this was really um, something that's been planned months ahead um, through the efforts of not just the ICD, the CCLI, but also Client Earth. And, and we're privileged to be part of this. And I was looking at the 2023 Global Risk Report by the World Economic Forum. And it's very telling is that whether on a two-year basis or 10-year basis, um, issues related to climate risk are not just globally uh, uh, recognized to be very systemic, but um, in terms of severity as well, no? it, it's, it's been recognized to be very much uh, front and center when you look at core considerations for decision makers. And a while ago, we were discussing about risk management, and I really feel that risk management is primarily uh, the role as well of the board, of course, through the committees as well as through management. And I'm reminded of this book by uh, Michelle Walker, and it's about a gray rhino, right? And, it, and the way she described gray rhinos is that, you know, these are, um, you, you could see them from afar, and they're walking slowly, if not, you know, moving towards you. Um, but you know that if they hit you, they're very high impact, right? They're very probable you could see them. In short, you could see the clear and present danger if you look at legal uh, manuscripts. I suppose, for example, to a black swan, no? For a long time, people said all swans were white, and then uh, here comes... Um, Nassim Taleb saying, no, not all swans are white. There are black swans in Australia. And black swans are described in finance to be uh, low, low, low probability but disastrous high impact. And we've seen a lot of black swans in financial crisis. I look back in 1998, the long-term um, long capital management case where genius failed, they say. Um, you can't model all risks, number one. And then 2008 happened, the uh, global financial crisis. And now I think nothing could compare to what we're discussing today. Um, probably this is a pivotal moment for everyone, the sense that risk management has really to be, uh, has to be exercised and uh, deliberately attended to by everyone, all the stakeholders. And, you know, when you look at, for example, the um, global financial crisis, what, we're, what, what we have seen is that volatility, uncertainty, it's in the DNA of financial markets. It's the, in the DNA of business. I don't think we, we can ever say that we're fully hedged. Uh, any risk committee, um, I would not say that, no, that we're fully hedged. There's always the risk that we have not modeled, what we have not seen. But in the end, how do we apply that to, for example, the board of directors? And I'm, I was looking at the July 2022 primer of the uh, CCLI, and they mentioned that first, the duty of care requires directors to exercise reasonable care, skill, diligence in the discharge of their stewardship functions, including taking reasonable precautions against reasonably foreseeable harm. So the operative term there is reasonable and foreseeability, right? But sometimes, you know, your limits would also not allow you to see everything um, properly. Second, the same primer of the CCLA makes mention that understanding those duties in the context of a changing external context is particularly relevant in the case of climate change, where evidence of climate-related risks and opportunities is becoming ever more apparent and changes in regulation are gathering momentum such that the likelihood of a disorderly and disruptive transition increases. And, and I guess um, legacy frameworks will have to be revisited because there's really a lot that needs to be adopted for purposes of regulation. And finally, the same paper says that to discharge their duties, directors must integrate climate risks and opportunities within their governance roles. You know? all across the organization. And in this regard, we always look at consistency, comparability, reliability, clarity, and efficiency. And these are all the hallmarks of a disclosure system for all of our stakeholders. On our end, as, as a market operator and SRO, we are working closely with multiple stakeholders, our Securities and Exchange Commission, the Climate Change Commission, as well as other stakeholders, simply because uh, we realize that for us to get the information out there, um, the compliance officers will have to do their heavy lifting, so to speak. And in this sense, we probably would also look at how can we come up with more guidance documents to the end that the gray areas, no, 
uh, would, end, would not anymore be as gray so that we could provide for certain certainties and comparability. As in fact, um, the PSE, we did sign, sign up with, for example, the UNFCCC uh, in our pledge to continuously achieve climate neutrality within our operations. And, and I'm happy to note that we were the first stock exchange in the world to coordinate and sign that pledge with the UNF. C, aside from the work we do with the ASEAN exchanges. And of course, it's our hope that all of these efforts that everyone in, in the panel today and everyone in the audience, I'm sure, are doing back, back in your respective organizations will create a lasting long-term impact in terms of you know, whether it's plan A, plan B, or plan C, uh, whether it's really to make sure that you have good prices for your fundraising opportunities. And, and I guess then you get people to listen, uh, depending on how you frame the narrative. Um, why are we doing this? Because really, we cannot fail in this initiative. I don't think failure is an option here. Um, plus, and I'm always reminded uh, in the COP27 uh, uh, by, 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 uh, narrative, uh, that the welcome remarks by the Secretary General of the UN, Anto An Antonio Guterres, and he said that you know, we are on the highway to climate hell and everyone is still stepping on the gas pedal. I think it's high time that we all you know, step on the brakes um, simply because we don't want to fall off the cliff, right? The herd, whether there's a rhino herd that's walking towards us, will definitely cause everyone to fall off the cliff. And that's not a story that we want to share um, as happening, right? And I guess it's high time for all of us to collectively probably explore what are the metrics, what are the frameworks, because the regulators would definitely need everyone's inputs. And I guess when all is said and done, it's going to be a multi-generational discourse. It's not going to be for the current generation only. But overlaying all of this really is that uh, when you look at all of these discussions, it's going to have to be exercised at the micro level by the board, at the micro level also by all the companies, even those which are not publicly listed. And that's also where the regulations help. The, the SEC issued um, early this year as well for SRI funds to make sure for or non-SRI funds, um, sustainable and responsible investment funds, make sure that you know they are walking the talk, making sure that in, in terms of their portfolio, it's really um, dedicated to sustainability initiatives, ESG initiatives. And we hope that this is not just a one-off. We hope that we continue the dialogue, and we are happy to probably learn from you as much as hopefully we could also share in achieving your target. So thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Attorney Ritran, for those inspiring words. On so, behalf of ICD, I'd like to thank Joyce Stan of Client Earth. Attorney Joyce, thank you very much. Alex Cooper, thank you very much. The Climate, uh, the Commonwealth Climate Law Initiative, thank you for coming. Attorney Rowell Rivran, uh, thank you very much on behalf of ICD. Well, you are ICD as well, right? And Teresa Tuan, uh, Eric, thank you very much, Eric Francis, for running the top let's make a new term eric francia running the top it doesn't rhyme but uh, they're doing fast forward of course sir alex our our partner in pwc alex cabrera and of course to the author and the, the fine legal um uh, paper the position paper which we'd like to which has been published and thank you very very much to the commonwealth climate law initiative for publishing uh this uh very fine well-written uh paper Thank you very much and uh, maybe we can ask them to if they can have their seats and if there are any questions we can so they can have a bye thank you good afternoon everyone allow me to make the most of this opportunity to install our new icd members and if you can share just a few minutes of your time for this uh, very wonderful occasion the institute of corporate directors Society admits fellows and members who commit to bring the practice of corporate governance to a much higher level of professionalism, consistent with international best practice and global standards. ICD fellows and graduate members have demonstrated the commitment through ICD's four E's of professional directorship, namely education, examination, experience, and ethics. It's my distinct honor and privilege to recognize the following. As fellow, Dr. Erika Fele T. Legara, Independent Director of Rizal Commercial Banking Corporation. Please come forward. Uh, 
well, here she is. Please come forward. Thank you very much. You will be joined by three other members, graduate members, namely Attorney Saturnino S. Jaron Jr., Military Officer of the Armed Forces of the Philippines, the AFP. Sir, thank you for joining us, sir. Please come forward and say with your certificates. Followed by Dr. Alvin Valeriano D. Marcelo, Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Information Officer of St. Luke's Medical Center. Welcome, Dr. Alvin. Please come forward. And followed by Mr. Jose Paulo G. Rufo, Chief Information Security Officer and Data Protection Officer of Union Bank of the Philippines. Likewise, we also welcome two new associate members who have also displayed the virtues of good governance and have completed the preliminary educational requirements for membership to the ICD. First is Mr. Reynan Miguel Ortiz, previously from ICD, but now with SGV as Associate Director. Followed by Ms. Catherine Perez, Director of Corporate Governance Advocacy of the Institute of Corporate Directors. But, shall we announce Kathy? Well, we'll find out later that she is with the Ayala Group. So may we call on the Fellows Committee Chair, Attorney Pete Pedro Pete Maniego to lead the oath-taking of our new members, Trusty Pete and Fellows Committee Chair Pete. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Uh, good afternoon, uh, inductees. Uh, please uh, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, please state your name. Do sincerely pledge that I will truly and faithfully, to the best of my ability, execute the duties and responsibilities repose in me as a, please state your membership of the Institute of Corporate Directors. I commit to the mission of the Institute to promote its advocacy of good governance. I commit to abide by the Institute's rules and policies particularly its code of professional responsibility. I commit to the Institute's values of independence, patriotism, ethics, excellence, solidarity, and social responsibility. And adhere to these values in my professional practice and encourage others to do the same. So help me God. Congratulations and welcome to ICD. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our new members with a warm round of applause. Thank you for this wonderful event. Um, I did en I enjoy it very much. My name is John Stumdum from um, NRI Manila, and I have, actually have two questions um, for the panel. Um, on the legal side, how can private individuals or groups prove that actors of a specific company would be uh, considered detrimental in terms of the different risks that can be um, identified to them? Um, considering that in the Philippines, we've been saying that uh, our contribution to the global carbon scenario or the, the global climate, I mean, carbon contribution is about 0.4%. Uh, 
of the total uh, global emissions. And then I have also another question on the science-based targets um, because some, well, some individuals that I've, I've talked to over the years believe that science-based targets are very hard to do <laughs> considering that uh, we do have uh, difficulty in obtaining data in certain localities in the Philippines than which they would operate. How could this be addressed? Uh, who should address this and how can this be addressed? So that, that's it, thank you. Um, thank you for your question. Um, as I said, I'll, I'll respond to the first, the first question regarding um, risk and how you can prove it, especially in relation to the relatively small proportion of carbon emissions which, for which the Philippines are responsible. Um, so I think the, on, to address the latter point first, uh, the Philippines does have a relatively small percentage of carbon emissions in the global perspective, but it is still, I think, the 38th largest emission in the world meaning that there are uh, 170 countries with higher carbon emissions than the Philippines. So I think um, if you're looking at, in terms of assigning responsibility based on that alone, uh, that metric is, I think, a little bit flawed. Um, as, as the legal opinion mentions, there are very few environmental statutes which directly attribute liability to directors or officers of a corporation, or indeed to corporations themselves. Obviously, uh, boards need to be aware of their company's um, impacts on the environment, especially when they risk breaching regulations. But the duties angle goes beyond that. It's not just about avoiding breaching regulations and potentially being found liable for infringing environmental laws. It's about how do you avoid the material financial impacts of climate change on your company and how do you best avoid those? Focusing purely on the environmental law aspects of it um, is we think a little, it's, it's, it's valid, but it's quite a narrow way of approaching what is a systemic risk uh, which climate change poses. I hope that answers your question. Um, and I'll pass over to Charissa to answer the second part. Thank you for that second question on science-based targets. I assure you all of these are still evolving. There are different consultants, in, mostly international, but there are locals also, by the way. But, you know, even... Um, those of us in the boards or who sit or have sat at sustainability committees for a long time, we are still learning the measurements, for instance, the measurements that I've said that, uh, you know, for instance, some companies say X thousands of tons of GHG emissions in terms of carbon dioxide equivalents, even though as they're measuring that, that's still evolving. And sometimes you have to do a lot of remeasurements. How difficult are these? The first thing is to understand. And that's why my advice is related to your business strategy, so you can focus on certain things. Because as I said, these are evolving. For instance, uh, to give you a definite example, uh, an example, um, the amount of GHG emissions that are coming from replacement versus um, reduction, because uh, those that are you know, direct reductions coming from green energy, use of recycled pl plastics would be different from those that are coming from carbon replacement, let's say reforestation or measuring um, what comes from carbon sinks, uh, from carbon forests. So this, so what the, some of the um, international um, uh, assessors have been doing is to advise because they don't want, uh, you know, p uh, companies or people just buying carbon credits is to focus less or to give a lesser weight to those that are coming from carbon replacement or carbon offsets. But when they started to say that we might be capping it by, uh, well, there was a proposal for 10%. Of course, there was a reaction also that uh, for countries like the Philippines, which are not as developed as the other ones, it will be a lot more difficult to comply. So it's good that we have CCL, CCLI client earth here, that uh, perhaps the request is to look at certain standards for developing countries that, are really, that have a lot of social and poverty issues, that uh, you know, all of these um, measures may have to be looked at in, in terms of what's practical for the country. That having been said, the most important, since we have to develop an advocacy to make sure that these are ingrained into the DNA of the companies who can achieve positions of leadership, who can give examples, is to try to relate it to your respective goals, to your respective business strategies, 
and then identify what's important and start setting targets and proper measures. But yes, these are evolving and there's a lot of things that we need to learn. I myself learn a new thing every day, every time I sit at the sustainability discussion. But uh, it's good but because uh, you're feeling what's happening. You're feeling the higher temperature, the warmer temperature. Those of you who are actually doing scuba diving or doing snorkeling, you must have seen our bleached corals. It really broke my heart when I saw um, bleached corals in Palawan. It's, it's so sad to see since, since these are really treasures. So please uh, look at these things uh, seriously because uh, we really need to do much, much more even as, uh, of course, there has been an increased level of awareness. I think Eric also wants to share. Thanks, baby. I, I'm just inferring the question because I didn't hear the second question, but I, I think I can guess. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> much as this might sound like a shameless uh, plug, uh, I just want to, again, uh, it's a pleasure to narrate the journey of uh, ASEN. Uh, with what Baby is saying, uh, I couldn't agree more, Baby, that these uh, metrics, uh, ESG metrics, commitments, and so forth, should be inextricably linked to one's uh, strategy and culture and so forth. And I just want to share again the ASEN journey, this time forward-looking as opposed to the last uh, 12 years. Uh, as some of you might know, uh, we uh, announced, uh, and, and again, we've got uh, a number of independent directors here from ASEN. Again, uh, both Baby and Boots have been the pioneer uh, IDs of ASEN. And again, I can't express uh, my uh, thanks uh, better in terms of these foundational years. I know Boots is becoming sentimental here. I should stop. Uh, anyway, uh, we were co-architects in terms of um, uh, defining our bold ambition looking forward to 2030. Uh, we have ASEN 2030, which is our aspiration to reach 20 gigawatts or 20,000 megawatts of renewables by 2030. So it's quite bold. And uh, also, I'm proud to say that uh, we are the first company, energy company in Southeast Asia to complete uh, and define and commit to our net zero roadmap with specific milestones and programs, with specific uh, goals and metrics in 2030 and 2040 on our way to achieving net zero by 2015 uh, in, in lockstep with the rest of the Ayala uh, group. Uh, and, and just to put this thing to life, what Baby is saying, our ASEN 2030 vision and strategy is actually directly linked to the net zero. If you look at, and it's, all it's in, uh, every information is on our website, to give you some examples without going to too gory details, uh, one of our key metrics is our carbon intensity, <clears throat> where we have a baseline year measurement of 2021. And our 2030 goal is to reduce the carbon intensity by 74%, or almost 74%. Uh, so again, more or less in line with a uh, NDC of uh, 75%, and in line with the power sector uh, methodologies uh, aligned with uh, climate science. And by 2040, it's a 99% reduction in carbon intensity versus baseline. When we run the numbers, uh, and, and ask ourselves, does this fit well with our 2030 ambitions? And the, the, the result is that we have still a buffer of about 30%. So we can underperform, so to speak, although I can guarantee you we don't have plans of underperforming our ASEN 2030 vision. But there is a buffer. All we need to deliver really is about 14 to 15 gigawatts, and we would still be compliant. So there is, you know, we, we always say that uh, aspirations are... are or our vision or goal should be both aspirational and attainable. So we really stretch it, and it so happens that it's perfectly aligned with our uh, net zero uh, ambitions. We also, uh, and the sustainability team is here, uh, uh, proud to say that we also completed our first full TCFD reporting in 2022. So again, we're, we're pushing the, the, the boundaries in terms of uh, pioneering uh, the ESG standards and, and aspirations. So again, just thought I'd provide a, a little bit of color in terms of what Baby is saying. Uh, it's real and we're uh, uh, pilot testing and pushing the boundaries in ASEN. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I, I am Tony Kailao. I am an, I'm a fellow of ICD. Uh, 
let me enumerate some of my pet peeves on climate change and would ask the uh, panel to make their comments. Number one, uh, the commitments made by the companies extend up till so many years, up to 2050, 2040, by which time these fellows who made these commitments are no longer around. Number two, these uh, pledges do not have any legal sanctions. In other words, there are no penalties. Although Attorney Cesar said that there is now a law and any person can sue the company who made pledges. It, I cannot imagine a puny earthling like me suing a leviathan of a conglomerate. It's, it's like a replay of David and Goliath. No? Thirdly, uh, there are a lot of metrics that are very variable. Eric said that uh, it is not enough that you let go of a fossil fuel electric plant because you will just pass on the problem to the next guy. So do you get points for that? And finally, the wrath, the wrath of the, ad the adverse effects of climate change. Its wrath is not directed to the countries that are recalcitrant, nor is it directed to the countries that are compliant. It is directed on everyone. And the poor countries, the small ones, who suffer innocent, also get the wrath and the fury of the adverse effects of climate change. So it is like signing a death warrant for these small, small countries that will suffer because of this. And I think more death warrants will be signed if we do not do anything about it. So my question, what are your vast eternal plans to remedy or mitigate all these inequities as mentioned by one of the persons, the social injustices? Thank you. Tony, thanks very much for your commentaries and question, uh, quite provocative, contentious, uh, make it fun, uh, so that we're not just uh, agreeing, uh, you know, feeling good about this, no. Uh, but I must say that the issues that you raise are very much real and, and uh, discussed in, in the boardroom, in the, in the hallways, and so forth. I often joke that um, it's easy for us to make this commitment because somebody else will execute uh, against that. Uh, no, but uh, joking aside, uh, I think notwithstanding that Pang and Sheik uh, uh, remark, uh, I think it's still quite important uh, for a company to uh, commit no matter how long-term these goals are. And that's why I think uh, the roadmap is important. So it's not enough to say we will commit to 2050 net zero. Again, a lot of investors or stakeholders will uh, have some shadow of doubt there if you don't translate that into near or medium term roadmaps uh, and plans uh, and resourcing and so forth. And that is why it was important for us to translate this, what could be a feel good 20, net zero 2050 uh, commitment to what are we going to do differently between now and 2030 and then 2040 in measurable terms and measurable uh, initiatives. You know, just think of it this way. If, if we, if Ayala uh, Group did not commit to a net zero uh, 2050, we wouldn't be emboldened enough to aspire for 20 gigawatts of renewables by 2030, as an example. And guess what? By committing and being public out there of communication, yes, no one will hopefully sue us if we don't uh, uh, get to 20 gigawatts by 2030. It's a goal. It's a target. If we fail, it's not the end of the world. The important thing is we plan for it, we prepare for it, we execute to the best of our ability. Um, but the important thing is we are doing something uh, about it that is aligned with the long-term uh, goals. So I think that's the, the, and there's a lot of nuances in here. It's not only about plans, but capability building, shaping the culture of the organization, and so forth. So I think a lot of the realities here will go beyond what is legally um, uh, you know, proper or not. It, a lot of it touches on the softer stuff uh, as well, including, by the way, reputation, which is 
you know, the number one currency for a group like Ayala, and we are not unique uh, in this case. So, so I think uh, let's not underestimate as well the intangible impact of making these public uh, commitments. It's not just about what would be the con legal consequences. I know there's a lot of lawyers in this room, but what are the uh, social and economic um, uh, and cultural consequences if you are not really uh, doing earnest uh, uh, initiatives no, or effort? Thank you for that, Thank Eric. My, 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 sen my cynicism stems from my point number two, i.e., when these pledges are not fulfilled, there are no penalties. There are no uh, legal sanction, with the exception of what was pointed out by Attorney Cesar. And uh, I guess just to be facetious and even more cynical, I cannot imagine a company who has failed in its commitment. This company will go on a self-flagellation, punishing itself. You know, it's almost unthinkable. So my point is, uh, even for me, I am not a very imaginative person, but I can, end, uh, I can come up with an endless compendium of fancy promises and commitments, even if I want to greenwash. Because even if I don't fulfill them, there is no punishment anyway, and yet I look good. No, that is what greenwashing is all about. So that is my cynicism. But Eric, I know Ayala. I, <laughs> I've been familiar with the company. Friends and relatives are there. And uh, it is a company that has been a recipient of various uh, governance awards, including ones by ICD. So I, I, I agree and I empathize with what you are saying. But then again, extending my cynicism is that... Uh, you know, why bother? Nobody's punishing us anyway. And of course, uh, you know, just to be redundant, why punish the small countries when they have nothing to do with this, with this one? In fact, uh, in, in the Paris Agreement, the OECD countries are supposed to help the poor countries and give 100 billion in funding. Guess what? They, they came short. They never came up with the funding. And there are no penalties for that. You know, it's just uh, all promises and commitments. And if they do not fulfill their funding responsibilities, they are not punished. And the poor countries continue to suffer. Thank you. This is somewhat related to the issue raised by Tony Kailao. Uh, this is in terms of the director's uh, duties, responsibilities, and liabilities uh, with regards to, you know, maybe the climate change regulation. As I understand it, and I may stand corrected on this, in most jurisdictions, when violation of the uh, provisions of the law regarding ESG and climate change, directors and, uh, on, only incur civil liabilities. Okay, which means that most directors probably take comfort in the fact that they are covered by insurance, the directors of their liabilities insurance. Now, that doesn't really have teeth in it as far as, you know, uh, getting, uh, com getting this of directors and officers ensuring compliance with this regulation. So my question is, shouldn't we be pushing for or moving towards an environment where the failure to comply with this will re re uh, likewise uh, result in criminal liabilities, which means imprisonment of the directors who are responsible. Let me respond to the question, I guess more the first question, but maybe quickly addressing that. Uh, I, I, I think it was mentioned that at least the reporting, the disclosure will be mandatory. And uh, to be fair, uh, uh, there is a report from ICD also that 90% of the PLCs are actually already complying with sustainability reporting. Now, the extent of director's uh, legal liabilities, that's something that's still evolving. And of course, that is really for the regulators. Now, I just want to respond to what should we be doing if all of these are, are you know, issues that are up there. And uh, Tony said that, you know, people have a, a, a certain, you know, cynicism because 
um, you know, if you are committing to uh, net zero by 2050, we will probably be uh, six feet below the ground by then. But I'd like to start to explain what I said earlier. Actually, for many companies, and I'm not just saying that it's for the Ayala Group. Uh, by the way, Asens uh, Eric is for real, by the way. He even drives an electric vehicle. But <laughs> for, not just for the Ayala Group, but I've seen companies making definite commitments. When I talked about Manila Water, those targets are by 2025. And they're seeing the, we are seeing the business value that, for instance, if we're saying you want to have a 15% raw water buffer, in order to keep the water supply sustainable, then we know we need to replant, we need to plant trees, we need to reforest uh, our watershed areas. The Ayala land example that I gave Tony, what, when they set the target, that was five years ago, and they actually attained it in 2022. The plastics that you see being recycled in the malls are actually used as additives to construction materials. What I'm saying is these things can be done, but it really took a while. Admittedly, it's not easy. What we are appealing, actually, is even before the rules become mandatory, that we as directors, as leaders, step up front and be at the forefront of setting an example. Because there is a business value. As I, I, I think you heard from Eric, you heard from what we're saying about different companies. But people really see the business value of doing this. First, because, uh, precisely because of what was uh, said, that the Philippines ranks very high in terms of uh, vulnerability to climate risks. Second, you know, we don't want to lose our resources. And above all, we, we want to step up as leaders, as directors, that we can do this. And of course, uh, as mentioned, this is the reputational risk there are organizations that publish the names of companies that are very high plastic users. You don't want your company to be there. So I guess uh, what we're saying is try to be ahead and try to really advocate. Because this is not really just for your annual reports. This is for your children. And you, you will be surprised at the value. There's actually an HR consultancy. Are you Surya, I think it's the name, published in 2021 by Harvard Business Review that said uh, they surveyed employees. Uh, these are, well, I guess uh, these are more for the Western countries, but they said that 55% of employees surveyed said that ESG programs actually improve morale, and 38% said that they enhance loyalty. Why? Because the millennials, you know, the young people, they really love it. I was just sharing with Peter, you know. My son says he will eat less meat because, <laughs> because you know, cows, they say, are great, uh, are really great emitters of methane. And in Europe, sometimes they're already limiting the number of, uh, I guess, uh, areas uh, that are devoted to pasture lands or whatever, you know. But what, what I'm saying is, uh, well, we won't go to that uh, extreme, but and not yet, at least. Uh, in fact, we don't have a dairy industry. I always still uh, very much in early stages. All I'm saying is the request is really for the leaders, for the directors to step up and really show really a good example because we must do it. We must do it for planet Earth, but we must also do it for the business value in terms of all your stakeholders. I'd like to think that for all these companies, the regulators will love you, your community will love you if you really show very sincere, uh, if you demonstrate that uh, you are very sincere in all of these ESG programs. Yes, and then of course your employees, your investors, the, the lenders. So I, I think if you look at it from uh, the total value to stakeholders that ICD has been preaching, it's really well worth it. But thank you for the, the, those questions. I, I think this is really an opportunity to discuss all of these issues because they're really very, very relevant. But the people in this room probably have an opportunity to set the, the example in order for our country, for the planet Earth, <laughs> to get better. Thank you. I'd like to start by saying that the legal side is very much only part of the puzzle. And I think that a lot more, certainly at this stage of the emphasis, should be on the soft law uh, elements and the need to unlock business value, which Theresa and Eric have talked about. That's really the driving force at this stage. But to, do, but to address the legal arguments, firstly, to Tony's question, 
um, about the um, the lack of ability to hold companies responsible for their uh, for their targets. These go out in public disclosures, and uh, directors can be held personally liable under civil uh, and in some jurisdictions criminal law for misleading the market. So there is there are. You, you are not allowed to mislead your shareholders, and if companies are setting targets which they can't meet, that is what they are doing. It's important also to note that while some companies are setting targets which, are, which won't be completed until 2050, uh, the progressive companies are setting targets with interim targets along the way. 2030 is very important. Companies are setting targets for 2025, which is in two years. So there are real steps that are being taken along the way, and points at which shareholders uh, and stakeholders can hold companies to account. Um, but, but really, I think stakeholders are looking for companies to drive, to be progressing rather than attaining perfection on this. And it's much more about are you doing what you can rather than uh, are you meeting some sort of criminal liability. Um, to address the second question about directors incurring civil liabilities, uh, that's correct, and that's to do fundamentally with the way in which this is structured, that directors are liable to the company and the shareholders can hold directors liable through the company as a, res as, uh, as a result of that. And that goes to the fundamental precepts of fiduciary law. Um, there are some discussions in the EU about criminalizing environmental harm, and I think we're a way off seeing that. But I think that um, with climate change and the complexities that it involves, especially for corporations who are trying to do a difficult balancing act between pleasing shareholders, unlocking development, keeping value going in the long term, while facing against long-term climate risks and short-term climate risks which are arising now, being the, the threat of liability is real, but the, bone, the, um, the, sort of the carrot of doing the best you can and meeting, the require, meeting your market ex the expectations of your shareholders, regulators, governments, and your peers, and keeping your company uh, surviving and thriving uh, is uh, is a is a sort of more weighty factor. I think that I think that's the, probably all the time we'll have for questions. So I'll hand over to Sora now. But thank you very much. So, on behalf of the Institute of Corporate Directors, the Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative, and Client Earth, we thank you all so much for spending your morning and afternoon with us and making this event a very meaningful one. We hope to see you again in our future programs. Again, thank you and have a great day, everyone.